We have to have a good economy uh, to go further. So I think we will find uh, a way to understand each other, but we need to find this way faster. <laughs> That's all from this edition of Assignment, which was presented and produced by me, Peter Hadfield. That was Assignment from the BBC. I'm Jeff Goods, and this is CBC Radio 1. Good morning, Manitoba, and hello, Winnipeg. I'm Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio, and we are live, and so are you, on CBC. 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or YouTube, and thanks for spending some time with us this Thursday morning, or as my friend Abby likes to call it, it's Junior Friday. Uh, it is six degrees in the city of Winnipeg today. We are the hot spot in the province right now. Uh, currently, the cold spot is Churchill at minus four. There's light snow falling there. Over in Brandon, it's partly cloudy. It's two. And in Thompson, it is also partly cloudy and two degrees. In Winnipeg, we're heading for a high of 14, and we have a 30% chance of uh, late afternoon showers. If you need us on the drive, walk or roll this morning. 788-3093 is the commute line. And Dylan Longhurst is going to pick it up. Good morning, Dylan. Dylan's also directing the program today for Corey, who's off for a bit. Good morning. Speaking of Abby, Abby Adiemi is here also, our uh, regular uh, technician on the program, our senior tech, and also Abby's on the air with us covering weather. And good morning to Brad Lillies, who also joins us on the other side of the glass. It's two minutes to six. Let's find out what's making local news with headlines in Heather Walls. Good morning. Well, a Brandon woman says she's lost faith faith in the banking system after someone cleaned out her bank accounts with a fraudulent e-transfer. Nicole Roy says she lost $3,000 from her accounts at a Bank of Montreal branch last fall. She says she's never given anyone her PIN or her BMO bank card, uh, but she says she's still trying to recover her money. We're going to hear what she's doing to get that money back. And a Clear Lake business owner says the impact of a potential voting ban this summer could last generations. It is something Ottawa is considering as a way to get rid of zebra mussels, which were found in the lake last summer. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 6.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. We're going to have, actually, that business owner on for a full interview a little bit later in the program. We're also going to hear from uh, someone else who's uh, deeply concerned about that uh, possibility of a boat ban. In addition, this morning on the program, yesterday was a big day at the public inquiry into foreign interference. Uh, we're going to talk about what the Prime Minister had to say about what he knew and when he knew it. So stay tuned for that in case you missed the details. Today is World Parkinson's Day. So just switching gears here. It's a day to raise awareness of the disease. About 100,000 Canadians live with Parkinson's. We'll talk to an expert about it. We'll also talk about its prevalence here where we live in Manitoba. So stay tuned. Right now, though, it's time for World Report at 6. On cue with Tom Power. This is Jim Rockford. At the tone, leave your name and message. I'll get back to you. Mike Post composed TV themes like The Rockford Files and Law and & Order. He played guitar on I Got You, Babe. He discovered Kenny Rogers. A conversation with one of the most important figures in modern music that you may never have heard of, Mike Post. That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with Elamine Abdel Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, the CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Shareholders of Canada's biggest bank are gathering today for their annual general meeting. The Royal Bank of Canada is facing criticism for its support of fossil fuel projects. One report last year named RBC the world's biggest fossil fuel financier. As Thomas Daigle reports, activists are demanding the bank divest. We in the heart of Toronto's financial district, dozens marched ahead of the Royal Bank's big meeting. We want their shareholders to know that they need to hold their executives accountable. Crystal Cavalier from the Okanichi Band of the Suponi Nation is fighting a major natural gas pipeline near her South Carolina home, a project financed in part by RBC. We are here to tell them that they didn't get consent from our people. 
Recently, the bank bowed to pressure and agreed to start disclosing the ratio of money it puts into clean energy projects compared to fossil fuel extraction. But that should only be the start, says Tara Hauska from Kuchiching First Nation. They know they have a serious problem. They know that their shareholders care about this. In a statement to CBC News, the bank says it's working with clients and communities to help transition to a greener economy and intends to triple lending for renewable energy by 2030. Olaf Weber researches the financial industry and sustainable development and says it's not only RBC. Of course, it's a Canadian situation. Canadian banks are relatively high compared to others. Canada has a high ratio of, of fossil fuels. It's a reality that demonstrators say isn't changing fast enough. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. The Commission on Foreign Interference is not finished its work, but now that the Prime Minister has testified at the inquiry, this phase is wrapping up. Janice McGregor is in our Parliamentary Bureau, making sure the important details are not buried. And Janice, what do we know this morning? Marcia, notwithstanding how seriously Justin Trudeau says his government takes the threat of foreign interference when it comes to specific examples of election meddling that this inquiry has been probing, the Prime Minister seems to be either unaware or unconvinced. He described being pulled aside in an airport lounge during the 2019 campaign and briefed on what CSIS had shared with Liberal Party officials about their nomination meeting in the Toronto riding of Don Valley North. But Trudeau concluded their concerns weren't corroborated or confirmed. He suggested spy agencies don't understand that to get people out on a Saturday afternoon, sometimes you got to organize buses. And the Liberal Party intentionally, he said, allows teenagers and foreign nationals to participate to encourage broad participation in federal politics. In 2021, however, he said he wasn't briefed until after the campaign about potential disinformation in Chinese-language social media that was targeting Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole and several of his candidates. Trudeau disputed that China had a preferred election outcome that it was trying to achieve with this targeting, and he leaned on what the task force and panel of senior civil servants his government set up concluded that there wasn't proof of any riding being swung by this. As for the Globe and Mail reporting that a diplomat in Vancouver took credit for having defeated Conservatives and then returned to China, well, he didn't see that as proof either. One can imagine a diplomat in a far-off land, uh, you know, wanting to write back home to say, see, look, look what I did, aren't I good? Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Janice McGregor reporting from Ottawa. U.S. President Joe Biden is reassuring Israel amid concerns of a strike from Iran. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is promising to retaliate against Israel. A bombing in Damascus destroyed Iran's embassy and killed 12 people. There are reports U.S. diplomats are now reaching out to Iran's neighbors. They are asking Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar and Iraq to help ease the tension in that region. Officials in Russia are still working to help people displaced by floods. Water levels are rising in the Ural River near the border with Kazakhstan, and the flooding has not yet reached its peak. It started after a dam in the region collapsed on Saturday. Thousands of people needed to be evacuated in Russia and Kazakhstan. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling for more air defense supplies. Another wave of Russian missiles is pummeling his country. In Kiev, people spent another night underground taking shelter from drones and missiles. Officials say a thermal power plant just outside the capital was destroyed. Substations and power facilities were targeted in five different regions. Ukrainian officials say at least 200,000 people have lost power. A Vietnamese court has sentenced a real estate tycoon to death, Trong Mi Lan, was found guilty of illegally controlling the Saigon Joint Stock Commercial Bank for a period of 10 years. She was convicted in a fraud scheme amounting to over $12 billion. Lan used thousands of ghost companies and bribes to government officials to siphon funds. She was arrested in October 2022 in part as part of a high-profile anti-corruption campaign. 
There's a glimmer of hope for Julian Assange. The WikiLeaks founder has been behind bars in the UK since 2019. He's been fighting extradition to the United States. He would face multiple charges relating to the 2020 release of classified U.S. military documents. The CBC's Richard Madden is in Washington. And Richard, what is the latest development in uh, Assange's story? Yeah, there is some hope for Assange and his supporters after some surprising comments by President Joe Biden. He was asked about Australia's request for the U.S. to drop the slew of charges against him. Now, you'll recall for over 10 years, U.S. prosecutors have been seeking his extradition to face several espionage charges on U.S. soil for posting troves of secret military documents related to the Iraq war on the site WikiLeaks. Now, Assange's supporters say he's a journalist who exposed the truth and is protected by the First Amendment. But U.S. prosecutors say he endangered lives and exposed classified military secrets. Back in February, the Australian Parliament passed a motion for Assange to be released to his home country of Australia, and that was the question put to President Biden at the White House. Take a listen. Uh, do you have a response to Australia's request that you end Julian Assange's prosecution? We're considering it. So it's a bit faint, but he said we're considering it. So returning to Australia would give Assange a lifeline because if he returns to the U.S. and is convicted for the several espionage charges, he faces up to 175 years in prison. Assange has been fighting extradition for years. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, he sure has. Ever since he first published those secret military and diplomatic cables supplied by former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning back in 2010 on WikiLeaks, He's been on the run. He was granted political asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London in 2012 until he was basically kicked out five years ago. He's been in a London prison ever since, fighting extradition to the U.S. to face these charges. Now, Australia argues former President Barack Obama commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence before he left office. So Biden, who was Obama's VP, should give Assange the same treatment, they say. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. Canada's health minister is promising hundreds of thousands of seniors will receive dental work in May. CBC News previously reported many dentists across the country were reluctant to join the program. Marina von Sackleberg has an update. I'm supposed to have a cleaning and I keep putting it off because I don't know what's happening. Halifax senior Julie Kelsey should have insurance to pay for that dental work starting next month. But first, she has to find a new dentist. Her current clinic won't accept her claim through the new Canadian dental care plan. It does sound that it's going to be really hard to find someone. The public program will eventually subsidize trips to the dentist for one quarter of Canadians that don't have private health insurance. 1.7 million seniors are the first group to be covered next month. But dental associations say many dentists are reluctant to take part because Ottawa requires too much paperwork to process claims. Canada's health minister Mark Holland says he's working on that. We set up a task group to really get that administrative burden down as low as it can possibly get. National dental care is a key demand of the NDP, part of a deal keeping the Liberal minority government in power. New Democrat health critic Peter Julian says Ottawa needs to simplify things for oral health care providers. We want to maximize the number of dentists across the country who are part of the plan. The Conservative opposition will not answer questions of where that party stands on the $13 billion program. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report. News anytime at cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. Welcome to your Thursday morning, 6.10 a.m. You're on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. on the app or YouTube. As mentioned, I'm Marcy Marcusa. Live here in downtown Winnipeg with our team at the show, and we'll tell you about the weather today in a moment. It's always a lot of people that care about the weather, especially this time of year where we're changing to those nicer spring days. Well, it is time to dig out not just the sandals, but also your white jerseys. The Winnipeg Whiteout parties are back. This half hour, we're going to hear from a local brewery as they get ready to welcome more fans to our downtown. Also this half hour on the program, uh, this hour rather on the program, it is World Parkinson's Day. About 100,000 Canadians live with Parkinson's disease. Some of them are older, some of them are young. There's no cure for Parkinson's. 
but there are treatments. We're going to talk about the uh, disease. We'll also talk about its prevalence here in Manitoba. And we'll hear more about what was a big day at the public inquiry into foreign interference yesterday. We'll hear what the Prime Minister had to say, but more importantly, we're going to get some analysis of what he had to say this morning. So that's coming up. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells, who's in our local news department with headlines. Good morning. Well, the owners of the Winnipeg Jets want to help this city reduce homelessness. True North Executive Chair Mark Chipman says he and co-owner David Thompson are talking about creating housing for people who need to transition out of homeless shelters. We'll hear what they have in mind coming up. As well, the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is asking people to destroy a collectible set sold at their music stand because it has toxic levels of lead. We'll hear some details in our next local news at 6.30. That is such an odd story, hey? It really is. I I don't know if it's in the paint or what, but it was part of an Indigenous collection, and uh, the WSO says it's removing the product, and if you have those plates, immediately stop using them. All right, thank you, Heather. You're welcome. I remember for more news anytime, in between when we speak to Heather on the air here and hear our casts and uh, headlines, you can go to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. It is 6.12 a.m. It is Junior Friday. Yay. I love that. I don't. So I stole that term from Abby, right? Like he uses that term for Thursday. Have you ever said that your whole life? Or like, where did you get that I've from? I've always, I've always adopted a Junior Friday my whole life. It's just a way of anticipating the weekend because it looks so far. I love it. So I totally love once it. Once I say Junior Friday, I know, yeah, it's almost a weekend because a lot of people will always like waiting for Friday, but yeah. I wait for Thursday. I love that. So I wait for Junior Friday all the time. It's helped me. Do you know what it's done? in our house actually now that we use them. Bring it on. It's uh, we start to do things that we would only we do we would only reserve for Friday nights. So for whatever reason if we're going to barbecue, we might do that on a Friday evening and sit out on the back deck and and on Thursday night we might just make like more of a like a, I don't know, a, an oven meal. Mm. And so now it's like, oh yeah, I know we're barbecuing. It's Junior Friday. It's Junior Friday. Right. <laughs> uh how's the weather going to be if people want to do that today? Well, we 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 started off like uh, around 7 and then the mercury dropped to 6 and now we are at uh, 4 degrees. It's a mild stat still though for Thursday. In downtown Winnipeg we are currently at 4 degrees. We may see showers again today. I know a lot of people were like, oh we didn't see it, but some parts of the city saw showers. Totally. I heard from uh, from friends and family out in Transcona area and and even in the middle of the city, like uh, kind of like right central Redwood, Main Street, that kind of area, they got like a really strong dump. Like not just light showers, like real rain. At- Nothing much in the south, though, I don't think. No, the south, not in much, uh, but I got a kind of like a, a thunder bang. And I called my brother. I'm like, did you hear that? And really? And he's like, uh, nope. And I'm like, okay. Just depends the, where you were. The thunder rolled in, but we didn't see showers. You got the showers at your end. but we. So today we may be seeing such kind of a weather again today. That's slight chance of rain in some parts and, of course, uh, some parts of the uh, province as well. Today's forecast actually calls for a blend of sunshine and clouds and a chance of that shower that I talked about. It's going to be sneaking on us later in the afternoon. Now, as the day progresses, the winds will shift to the northwest, so keep an eye out for that. But despite the possibility of showers, the temperatures are still climbing. We'll be getting to a high of 14 today. And if we move into the night period, the, the clouds we're going to be experiencing during the evening period will be dispersing and then leading to partly cloudy skies. But not a bad day in Winnipeg today. A mix of sun and cloud, a high of 14, and just a slight chance of showers. All right. Thanks, Abby. Yo. And now it's time for the morning commute. And Dylan Longhurst is in for Corey, as mentioned. Good morning, Dylan. Good morning. I'm kind of disappointed I didn't experience any of those uh, showers the other day or thunder that's what i look forward to in the spring so do you like a good rain like oh, a good storm yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially to clean things up at this time of year. So that first like big rainstorm is what I'm waiting yeah. on. I was surprised only because you know I have I have an afternoon nap because I mean getting up this early. Mm-hmm. But um, and and I woke up and I t- called my mom and she's like, "Did you get it?" And I'm like, "What? I was sleeping. What happened?" And then immediately I went outside to see. You know, was it, was it wet outside and and nothing uh, where I am, kind of around Polo Park area, uh, nothing on the ground, no wet. But apparently, I Transcona got a really big dump. Yeah, so. still waiting on that one for uh, for where I am at, but. Uh... As for the commute, quiet so far. Easy uh, easy commute out there. And weather's going to warm up, so it's going to be a lovely day to get outside today. If you see anything out there on the roads, let us know. Call 204-788-3093. Well, 
we're going to get some more people back downtown on the streets for the whiteout parties. Round one of the NHL playoffs will hit Winnipeg and there will be a Winnipeg Jets whiteout party. True North Sports and Entertainment made the announcement official yesterday. A lot of us were musing about it, thinking that it probably would come back, and it is. The province of Manitoba is going to provide some funding to make this happen. $75,000 per playoff round to support the parties. Economic Development Winnipeg, meantime, will provide $50,000 from its special event tourism fund. So it's not cheap. But uh, a lot of, uh, obviously, organizations in the province deem this uh, something that's uh, important to have people gather downtown and support the Jets. So at the news conference, Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe was there. Here's what he had to say about it. And I'm very proud that our team is here to, to play a role in supporting the great efforts of the Winnipeg Jets and True North because Winnipeg Jets hockey is more than just a game. It's an identity. This is part of who we are. And the fact that the whiteout street parties provide an affordable, accessible way for Manitobans from all walks of life to participate is so great. And the fact that it's going to a good cause, the funds being raised, makes it all the better. And so this is one of those things that our national pastime is all about, bringing people together, giving us a reason to celebrate, and also providing an avenue for the community-mindedness that uh, is the hallmark of Manitobans. So I'm just overjoyed to be here today and to indicate our support. And of course, yes, we are here uh, with some funds. The way the funding arrangement works on behalf of the province is that we contribute more money the further the Winnipeg Jets go into the playoffs. <laughs> I absolutely do not want to jinx anything, but I will say that this is one area of government finance where I don't mind seeing us go over budget. <laughs> Premier Wab Canoe speaking at the press conference yesterday uh, for True North and with the whiteout parties. Those parties will happen on Donald Street uh, once again between, between Portage and Graham. They happen during every Jets home game. And they start two hours before puck drop. If you've never been, they, they really are kind of fun. Uh, the games are going to be broadcast live on three large outdoor screens. So bring your fold-up chair. Past Whiteout Street parties have been packed. They bring thousands of people downtown for every game. Now that is, of course, good news for some downtown businesses, including a Devil May Care Brewing Company. Colin Coop is the owner. It's located on Fort Street. He spoke with Up to Speed host Faith Fundal yesterday. Hey there, how are you? I'm doing well. What about you when you heard about this? I, I think hey. this is what, your second year as a new business taking part in, in the Whiteout festivities? That's right. This is uh, second Whiteout season, and uh, we couldn't be happier about it. And what was it like last year, and what, what are you expecting this year? You know, last year, um, the crowds were absolutely electric. They were they were just into the games. Um, they packed our, our brewery. We have a 100-seat tap room. Uh, we rarely see it, like, full to full to capacity uh, we were pretty close that day um, there were so many people who were so passionate and even when uh, the game started and people would normally clear out to watch the games they stuck around we had like people watching the game all the way through and it was just uh, an all-out party uh, for the entire time it was amazing to be a part of it i've been into your tap room a, a few times now and each time i go it, it is quite busy when you have something like this that that funnels people into the downtown, particularly close to where you are. Um, how would you characterize how big of, a, um, uh, of an economic boom do you see? How, how big of a deal is this for, for folks like you? Oh, it's, it's everything to us. I mean, uh, the Jets in general are a cornerstone of our, uh, of our plan, our business plan for being downtown. So um, to have people down there regularly watching games and things like that, when they make the playoffs, it's like it's gravy on top of everything, um, and it's just wonderful to see. Um, it really, it, like, it helps to pay the bills. It helps to get a little bit ahead. We are, you know, undertaking a little bit of an expansion, and um, that uh, is because of nights like that where we can count on whiteout parties and things like that. So, um, really, the better the Jets do, the better that Winnipeg uh, downtown businesses do like us. So it sounds like that uh, you have thought about your business plans um, as, as we get closer to the playoffs. Totally. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, we're eagerly awaiting the announcement from today and, uh, and just waiting to see kind of what the plans are. And we're going to base our next few weeks uh, and hopefully, you know, as we get deeper into the playoffs, hopefully we can keep on planning with them and, and, and cooking up new things to do uh, on game days. Uh, so we'll definitely be... Uh, Jets focused for the next, you know, 
hopefully until they reach the cup. What might uh, the beer menu look like to celebrate the Jets? Oh, so we've always got 16 things on tap. We've always got 14 beers and two meads. Everything uh, made in-house, uh, including the meads. Um, so we've got a rotating selection. You'll find, you know, stuff that we normally do, like our core products. But you'll also find small batches, things that we do just as tests, things that are fun. Um, and you might find a few surprises in there, too. Things that uh, nobody's kind of expecting, but uh, they might pop up during the, during the playoff run. You mentioned a possible expansion. What, what would it take for, for you to be able to say, yep, this expansion is a thing now? What, 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 do, you need to, what do you need to see for the next little while? Uh, basically, it's just income. We just need to see some funding um, because you know, we're, we're kind of halfway through those things right now. So any bit uh, of business is, uh, is just a little bit extra on top. That helps us uh, stay out of the hole <laughs> as, we, as we look to, to put money into, uh, into expansion. Can you tell us what that expansion might look like, or is it too soon? Uh, we can absolutely talk about that a little bit. Um, so basically what we're, uh, what we're adding is another couple tanks uh, to our system, uh, and that basically effectively uh, doubles our capacity, uh, which is great for us and means we can serve more beer to more Winnipeggers. Colin Coop, the owner of Devil May Care Brewing Company, on Up to Speed yesterday, speaking with host Faith Fundal. Uh, there was made mention there, uh, the Premier made mention in what we heard from him uh, yesterday, Wab Kanu, about the uh, fact that this the street parties also act in part as a, a fundraiser. Uh, so they raise funds because their ticketed events from $5 to $5 rather of every $10 ticket is reinvested into the community through United Way and uh, supporting agencies whose work is centered around uh, people experiencing homelessness, addictions, and mental health challenges. Now, later this morning at 10 to 8, Bartley Kivas is going to be in with a report because the Jets owners are looking at ways to help the city succeed in reducing homelessness. So we'll hear more about that coming up in the next hour. Customers often lie to companies in surveys, polls, and focus groups. Yet advertisers rely on that flawed and false feedback to market brands and create advertising campaigns. So what are advertisers to do? Pants on fire when customers lie to marketers on Under the Influence with Terry O'Reilly. Tomorrow morning at 11.30, 3.30 p.m. in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app. 6.23 a.m. You're on Information Radio on CBC. I'm Marcy Marcusa. And up next, the Prime Minister on the hot seat. Every briefing I've ever got from all my intelligence and uh, security experts is that those elections were indeed free and fair. We started from a standing start. Um, we created the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Uh, we created NCIRA. Um, we moved forward to the rapid response mechanism, and we've continued uh, to do more. That is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau yesterday speaking on the foreign, foreign public inquiry into foreign interference. Wesley Wark is here to analyze more what was said yesterday. He is a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. Good morning. Good morning, Marcy. So what stood out for you from what uh, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, had to say? Well, it was a long day. He was a witness stand for nearly four hours. Um, and, and inevitably, uh, he spent a lot of his time um, defending his government's record since it came into power in 2015, arguing counterpoint, inevitably, that the Conservatives have done nothing. When he came into office, he talked about, you know, looking at the threat environment, talking to allies, learning from allied lessons, particularly in terms of the U.S. presidential election, Russian interference in 2016, taking stock of all that, building up new mechanisms to try and monitor election interference by foreign actors, um, putting the intelligence group together, the so-called site task force, creating this panel of five senior public servants who would have an independent capacity during an election period where, where the parties are campaigning, the government is really not in office, to provide a public warning about election interference if they felt the high threshold had been met for that. So, you know, lots of details about that, lots of defense of his government's record in really paying attention to the threat. And the really surprising thing for me is that I expected, I must confess, a lot more political theater to the whole thing, especially in cross-examination, because in this inquiry, there are counsel for various Conservative Party entities who, who would have their opportunity to take their shots at the Prime Minister. But nothing really emerged from that. Uh, it, was, it was pretty <laughs> downbeat, I must say. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, four hours later, the Prime Minister emerged from all this uh, pretty unscathed, I think. 
What about his demeanor? Um, you were talking about what you expected from the questions, but what about his demeanor? This is his second appearance before an inquiry because, of course, he was before the Rouleau Commission. Yes, he was. Yeah, and I attended that as, as well and, and many of the other hearings for, for that commission into the Freedom Convoy events. You know, I think the, I think it has to be said, I don't mean this as a partisan comment, that the Prime Minister tends to shine in these occasions. He's very confident. His memory is sharp, at least when he can talk about things that aren't, you know, hidden behind the veil of, of secrecy. There was an extraordinary moment, I thought, in, in the testimony where he recalled in, in great detail this briefing he had had um, Back in 2019, you know, so this is this is five years ago, a briefing that he'd had while he was on the campaign trail from from one of his senior kind of staffers about uh, some some concerns about a, a nomination contest for a liberal candidate. It happened in an airport lounge, but he really recounted his kind of thought process in, in great detail. Uh, you know, so he has that kind of uh, you know fly trap memory. Um, he was very confident. His demeanor was was very confident and. Uh, you know, there were even a couple of, of laughs he managed to, to get into the whole proceedings. So what, a confident man really in charge of his brief. And what about the uh, several cabinet ministers that uh, we heard from uh, involved in both the 2019 and 2021 elections? What did you take away from what they had to say? Well, again, you know, not surprisingly, Marcy, I mean, they, they were kind of all lining up cabinet solidarity to basically present the same point of view about how the government had created these, these policies and important mechanisms to guard against election interference. You know, I think the most interesting thing for me was really it was a little bit of a kind of history lesson, which we don't get very often from government ministers about, you know, how and why they'd started up this whole process, how they built these institutions. You know, what was the thinking? What was the rationale? Um, you know, behind important election uh, protection mechanisms that were present for 2019 and 2021 and would, will be present in the future to try and guard against election. So understanding where all that came from, I thought was very important. So, uh, as you said, there were no big surprises yesterday. What have we learned about the sorts of difficulties facing the country, though, uh, about the problem from possible foreign interference, both before but also during elections? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there are three takeaways so far. You know, the Commission is only partway into its work. It hasn't issued its first report yet. That comes out on, on May 3rd. You know, the first thing is that, you know, foreign interference is, is a real threat. It's it's pervasive. It's going to continue. It's going to impact Canada during elections and, and obviously in, in periods between elections. It has to be watched for, has to be guarded against. And I think the other two things, and just in terms of thinking about the nature of that foreign interference threat, the, the two big messages that have come across for me so far are, one, that it's really diaspora communities Chinese Canadians, for example, when we're talking about the People's Republic of China and, and really their lead role that they play in foreign interference, but also the Sikh Canadian community and others. The Asper groups are on the front lines. They're, they're facing potential intimidation, harassment, suppression of their vote in various ways, misleading information. Uh, and, and that relates to the second big point, which is that foreign, foreign interference is, is maybe not what we think about. It's not sort of people skulking around on the ground. It's really that swirl of false information in the online information space that we all live in. Very difficult to, you know, combat that. Very difficult, of course, to judge who's behind it or who might be behind it. Is it a foreign actor? Is it just the circulation of false information that will always happen? Very difficult to gauge how serious it is. All of those messages have come forward in the commission hearing. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and analysis. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Martha. Wesley Wark, a conversation we had at 6 o'clock this morning. He's Senior Fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation, and he attended those hearings yesterday. We will hear uh, more, of course, coming up, more analysis in your national and international news. You are with Information Radio on CBC. I'm R.C. Marcusa. Thanks for spending Thursday morning with us. Appreciate having you along for the uh, for the show. Coming up, we have uh, business news with Crystal Lee Ramlikan and the Bank of Canada holding the key interest rate at 5% yesterday. We'll uh, get more analysis about that decision, right? Now, your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. We are starting Thursday with clouds. It's four degrees right now downtown. We will see some sun, a mix of sun and clouds today, northwest breeze, a high of 14, and like yesterday, we have a chance of showers. The owners of the Winnipeg Jets want to help the city reduce homelessness. David Thompson and Mark Chipman are talking about providing transitional housing. CBC's Bartley Kivas reports. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. 
Applause for Mark Chipman following a speech last week at Winnipeg's Portage Place. Chipman's True North Real Estate Development wants to redevelop the mall. The project includes a residential tower. Chipman says he wants to do even more. He says he and Jets co-owner David Thompson, one of the wealthiest people in Canada, want to help create housing for people living in shelters. What we lack desperately in the city right now is the ability to transition people out of that type of living arrangement into a more independent uh, circumstance, and it just doesn't exist. Ottawa-based sports economist Glenn Hodgson says few NHL owners are this community-minded. It's really hard to come up with another example of an owner who's made such a large commitment to not-for-profit investment. Chipman and Thompson met with Winnipeg's mayor and premier about housing in December. Premier Wab Kanu says their real estate and business acumen can complement the work of governments and nonprofit organizations. Bart Lakivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. A Clear Lake business owner says the impact of a potential boating ban this summer could last generations. Ashley Smith opened Turtle Village in Clear Lake Fishing Village last year. She says it was a big struggle getting started as an Indigenous business in Riding Mountain National Park. Smith has fears for the survival of her business and others if the federal government decides to close Clear Lake to watercraft to protect the lake from invasive zebra mussels. It's going to hit us pretty hard because we're away from a lot of people. Like We're close to Brandon, but the bigger cities and areas, they have to make a true investment to come out here and, and take work off. And, you know, it's not an easy task. Ottawa says banning watercraft on Clear Lake is one of the options it's considering after live zebra mussels were found there late last year. A Brandon small business operator has turned to an ombudsman service for banks after having her bank accounts emptied in a fraud. Nicole Roy says an unknown person took $3,000 from her Bank of Montreal accounts in a fraudulent e-transfer. She says the bank gave her $500 as a goodwill gesture, but she has filed a complaint with the National Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investments to try to recover the rest of the money. Roy says it's disappointing only about a quarter of the banking complaints to the ombudsman last year resulted in customers being paid compensation. That's crazy. And it just goes to show you that whatever's happening here is, I don't know, it just feels like they're all in on it. <laughs> Because whatever is happening here is not being addressed. The ombudsman, Shelley, uh, Sh Sarah Bradley, tells CBC News uh, the, uh, the ombudsman service for banks is impartial and independent of banks and financial services. Meanwhile, shareholders of Canada's biggest bank are gathering today for their annual general meeting. The Royal Bank of Canada is facing criticism for its support of fossil fuel projects. A report last year named RBC the world's biggest fossil fuel financier. Russia's month-long bombardment of Ukraine continues. In Kyiv, people spent another night underground taking shelter from a barrage of drones and missiles. Among other targets, a power plant just outside the capital was destroyed, and power facilities across five different regions were also hit. Ukrainian officials say close to half a million people are without power. You can hear more national and international news coming up on World Report at 7. The Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is asking people to destroy a collectible set sold at their music stand because it has toxic levels of lead. Health Canada has issued a recall order on Tranquility and Teachings sets from the Canadian Art Prince Indigenous Collection. Those plates feature artwork by painter William Monahue. The WSO says it is accepting recalls on all the plate sets out of an abundance of caution. It's removing the product from its inventory and post recall notices at upcoming concerts. The WSO asks anyone who has bought those plates to immediately stop using them. Health Canada says as of late last night, uh, last month, almost 1,500 plates had been sold in Canada. And the start of the Masters has been delayed by at least an hour, perhaps longer, because of bad weather at Georgia's Augusta National Golf Course. Storms, heavy rain, and strong winds have been forecast. The first round was scheduled to begin at 7 central time, with Eric Van Royen and Jake Knapp going out in the first group. Five-time Masters winner Tiger Woods is set to tee off this afternoon. And Canadians playing in this first major tournament of the year are 2003 Green Jacket winner Mike Weir.
Weir, along with Nick Taylor, Adam Hadwin, and Corey Connors. You can find more news updated throughout the day. Just head to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Well, Heather, I'll tell you what. If you are waiting for the Masters to start and you like to watch golf and you need something to look at and wait and do, go to the Winnipeg Humane Society site. They've got a fundraising calendar, and right now you can vote for the animals that should be like the pinup animals. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I, I What's full, July? Full, <laughs> full disclosure, I voted for Pearl because it's my friend's guinea pig. And this, this is the description of Pearl. It says, hi, I'm Pearl. As you can see by my adorable face, I'm a guinea pig that's in my middle years, but a lady never discloses her age. <laughs> <laughs> There's just adorable photos here of people's pets. So your friends and family, you might not even know, but uh, maybe you've got uh, a friend or family that has their their pet put up there to support the Humane Society. That's very cute. (laughs) It's very cute. All right, uh, let's get into what's happening in the weather forecast. Abby Adiyami's in with our details. Good morning. Once again, across the province, we're experiencing mostly cloudy conditions this morning. Winnipeg, we are currently mild at four degrees. Today, we will be seeing a mix of sun and clouds. And later, we might see some rain showers, uh, just uh, slight showers uh, in, across uh, the southern part of the province. But the temperature will rise to a comfortable 14 degrees later. Tonight, the skies will clear and then that slight chance of showers, we might notice it again. Heading west to Brandon, it's currently 2 degrees with partly cloudy skies. Expect a mix of sun and clouds, also a chance of showers this afternoon and you'll be heading to a high of 13. Moving up to Thompson, it is uh, zero, partly cloudy at the moment. Expect uh, mainly cloudy skies and a chance of flurries this morning or some rain showers would come with that. You will be seeing a high of five. Further north in Churchill, it's currently minus four. That's the cold part this morning with light snow. Today will bring mostly cloudy skies and then you see some flurries and gusty winds. You get a high of minus two. In Dauphin, it's currently one degrees with partly cloudy skies. We are going to be seeing a mix of sun and clouds also and a chance of showers this afternoon high of 12. Now for Gimli, Steinbeck and Morris it's all sitting at 3 degrees with partly clear skies and highs for that part of the province would hover around 13s and 14s in Winnipeg it's currently 4 degrees and mild. Today's weather brings a mix of sun and clouds and we might see some showers later but temperature will be reaching a high of 14. Alright thanks Abby You're welcome. And with details on uh, the commute although it's been very very quiet with the spring weather. Uh, Dylan Longhurst is in for Corey. Yeah, it's had been a really quiet morning, actually. Really lovely day out there to get started on the Thursday. We heard from Dan on a bike who said it's a beautiful day to get out biking, but did want to give a tip to any new cyclists who are uh, taking to the bike pass for the first time this spring. You know, with a, this kind of messy season, you want to make sure you're uh, careful of the gravel and those rougher conditions on the roads and bike paths, especially around turns, you don't want to be wiping out on your morning commute to wherever you're going today. Just a little tip there from Dan on a bike. If you're out there on the roads and you're seeing something get in the way, you know, you know, always give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. The number to call is 204-788-3093. Thank you, Dylan. And thank you, Dan. And uh, speaking of bikes, in the next hour of the show, we're going to be talking about uh, whether or not uh, you want, might want to tune up your bike. Uh, the thing is, you might find when you go, there's a big lineup. We're going to hear from one Winnipeg bike shop that already has a two-week backlog. So stay tuned. That story is coming up. Right now, it's time for business news with Crystal Lee Ramlikan, who joins us via Zoom. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Good morning, Marcy. Yeah, nice to see you always. Uh, let's talk about yesterday, what the Bank of Canada did. Uh, people likely to have heard by now, they held the key interest rate at 5% yesterday. Uh, what was behind that decision and maybe possibly what they're going to do next? Yes, that's right. So the bank held the overnight rate steady for the sixth time in a row since July. And now it says it's going to be looking for signs that slowing inflation is sustained before moving on rate cuts. So the central bank said inflation is still too high, but noted that core inflation, which strips out volatile sectors like food and energy, uh, has been going down in recent months. But Governor Tiff Macklem said the bank needs to be assured it's not a temporary dip. And he said a rate cut in June is, quote, within the realm of possibilities. Now, inflation has cooled, but high rent and mortgage interest costs continue to drive it up. 
However, though, the bank expects inflation will move closer to its 2% target this year and that it will reach it next year in 2025. But, uh, you know, some economists say the longer the bank holds interest rates, the more it risks tipping the economy into an unnecessary recession. Here's Don Desjardins, who is the chief economist at Deloitte Canada. So we do think that we will see um, the bank in position to, to lower the policy rate. And, and I think it does reflect um, our sense that we are seeing these inflation pressures ease. Um, certainly when you look at the um, trend rates of inflation, uh, underlying inflation, they have come down quite significantly. And if that persists, and, and we do think it will, we, we think that does open uh, the door to a rate cut as soon as June. So as she was just mentioning there, there the next scheduled announcement is set for June 5th. Uh, to another story here, we also saw the latest U.S. inflation numbers yesterday, Krista Lee. Uh, what is happening south in the border in terms of the economy there? Well, U.S. stocks fell sharply after inflation data for March came in higher than expected at 3.5 percent year over year. And core inflation came in even higher at 3.8 percent. And it was the highest annual gain in the past six months. So gas and shelter costs contributed more than half of that monthly increase. But prices rose in pretty much every major category as well. Investors worry that the hotter than expected report will push back the federal Federal Reserve's timeline for rate cuts. Here's Jason Shanker, who is the president of Prestige Economics. Our base case scenario has been for Q3 at the earliest, but now we think that given that inflation is still running hot, we're way above the Fed's 2% target, and there was an acceleration in headline inflation, there's a chance we could see people begin to talk about rate hikes again. And Maybe rate cuts are off the table for the rest of the year. Well, the Fed's going to remain data dependent, so we really need to see if things get worse. So when the Fed raises interest rates or indicates that they may stay higher for longer, markets tend to fall. And this happens because when it costs more for companies to borrow money, other investments might look better compared to stocks. But uh, investors may be getting ahead of themselves here. There are two more inflation reports due out before the Fed's June policy meeting. And before we look at the numbers this morning, a new low-cost wireless carrier is expanding into Canada, in, uh, including with plans for Manitoba, right? Yes, that is right. So Quebec Core is expanding its discount wireless brand Fizz to four provinces. So it's expanding to Ontario, there in Manitoba, Alberta, and BC through a framework that allows regional cell phone providers to compete across the country using networks built by its larger rivals. The discount brand says it will offer introductory plans starting at $14 a month in certain regions. And uh, the expansion outside Quebec follows a four-month trial. Fizz says new customers will be able to keep their plans and rates for as long as they like. And the company is promising no end dates and no haggling on its part. Martin Jean-Jean is the general manager of Fizz. Our cost structure is, is, is lighter. So this is this is what we want to be able to do. So so we don't have to support uh, stores. We don't have to to support commission. Uh, so we try to give that value back to the customer. So we try to be uh, a little bit more competitive in terms of pricing. It's planning to extend its reach to more towns and regions in those four provinces within a few months. And the goal is to eventually offer service to 90% of the Canadian population. My head's on a tangent because it's called Fizz and I, I was obsessed with those candies in the 80s. Did you eat those ever back in the day? They're in some old school candy shops now. You can find them. No, what, what were they like? Are okay. they like the like kind of like pop rocks or something? Or kind of, it's like a hard candy shell, and you eat it and it dissolves, and then inside it goes, <laughs> ooh, and it activates in your mouth. That's a, that's my sound for what it feels like in your mouth, and it literally was like white foamy fizz. I want one now with my coffee. Strangely, um, <laughs> kind of gross, but kind of good. What's up with the markets today? Nostalgia is a very potent drug. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in Europe, stocks are falling as markets digest U.S. inflation. Germany, the U.K., and France are all down. 
In Asia, markets also largely fell. Japan is down, Shanghai is up, Hong Kong is down. Oil is down 39 cents to 85.82 US per barrel. Gold is up $8 to $2,356.30 US per ounce. And the dollar is down 0.02 of a cent to 73.07 cents US. We will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Marcy. With business news, that's Crystal Lee Ramlikan. Six forty-five a.m. It is uh, four degrees in the city of Winnipeg, mostly cloudy. Brown and partly cloudy too. Thompson's mainly clear and one degree right now, and the commute's looking just fine. Coming up in this half hour of the program, it is World Parkinson's Day. We're going to hear more about how uh, the advocates continue to try to raise awareness about the disease, and uh, it's growing uh, numbers across Canada. The growing numbers of people who have Parkinson's. Well, next on the show on our CBC.ca/slash Manitoba website this morning, a story about a southwestern Manitoba woman who says that she was shocked when her bank accounts were emptied in a fraudulent e-transfer. But she's also not optimistic that a complaint to an ombudsman service will help because nearly a quarter of such complaints led to customers, only about a quarter of such complaints rather, led to customers getting monetary compensation last year. So it's difficult to get your money back, and it's a huge issue. Canadians have lost $123 million to fraud so far this year. That's according to numbers from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Now, some of the money was lost in scams that involve Bitcoin payments for job and investment opportunities, and some were even done through dating apps. And while incidents do get reported to police, as you just heard, uh, RCMP suspect a large number have also gone under the radar. Corporal Gavin Moore is with the RCMP headquarters in Charlottetown. Fraud as a whole is a a growing problem. We've seen an 85% increase in the number of reported frauds to the RCMP over the last five years. Cryptocurrency-related fraud is just like any other fraud. It certainly is on the rise. And any opportunity a scammer has to receive funds, which cryptocurrency does provide this ability, to receive funds from farther away, perhaps even internationally, they will take advantage of these opportunities. And the vast majority of these cases are situations where individuals have uh, fallen for a scam of any type, but this is the method of payment that the scammers have asked for. So there are three main methods of payment that scammers often ask for. Money wire service, they get the money quickly and easily and can get it from anywhere. In-store cards, so these are cards, they will get people to go in and buy these cards, the gift cards, and provide the information on the back of the card. Again, the scammer has access to the value of that card immediately. And Bitcoin is another common theme where they will encourage somebody to go to a Bitcoin ATM and make a deposit and essentially wire that money away. The number of scams that we see is only limited to the human imagination. They'll come up with investment scams where you may see an advertisement or you may get a message from a known contact in your social media telling you about how they just made a bunch of money or telling you about opportunities uh, to to make huge returns very safely and that they succeeded with this. And then the victim will be encouraged to go on and invest in one of these scams. Uh, We also certainly see scammers can use this in romance scams where they may pose as a successful Bitcoin investor and then uh, will recruit the victim to make deposits or to take some actions and inevitably the victim will end up losing their money. Uh, Ultimately, if anybody is ever asked to make a payment in any method, uh, we would encourage them to stop, take a breath, and ask themselves if this is a scam. Anybody who's asking for payment in Bitcoin should be a huge red flag right off the bat. Uh, This is not a commonly uh, used to transact tool or instrument. And so anybody who's asked to make a payment, we certainly would say that's a red flag to be aware of. And any time that you're being told about huge returns, especially if you learn of this online, that's a big red flag as well. Corporal Gavin Moores with the RCMP in Charlottetown, PEI. And if you want to read that story about the woman from Manitoba who recently had an issue uh, with a fraud, please read what happened to her at cbc.ca slash Manitoba.
It's 10 to 7 right now on CBC, and uh, there's a bit of clearing downtown. We can even see a bit of blue sky. Uh, Four degrees in Winnipeg right now. Next on the show, the number of Manitobans suffering from Parkinson's disease is expected to hit 12,000 by 2031. That's according to the Parkinson's Society of Manitoba. And across Canada, that number is uh, of people with a degenerative neurological disease could be 163,700 by 2031. Today, as we've been mentioning, is World Parkinson's Day. It's a day to raise awareness, but also to celebrate people living with Parkinson's in the wider communities. It is marked every April 11th because that is the birthday of Dr. James Parkinson. He is the English surgeon who first described the disease back in 1817. There still is no cure for Parkinson's. It presents with a variety of symptoms, touching the elderly, but also young people. For more on uh, what is still an elusive disease all these years later since it was discovered, uh, Karen Lee's with us. She is President and Chief Executive Officer of Parkinson Canada. Good morning. Good morning. So for people that have not ever leaned into Parkinson's, can you describe what it is exactly? For sure. So Parkinson's disease, is, it's a complex disease, but it's a neurodegenerative disease, so it impacts the brain specifically part of the brain uh, that produces dopamine. And dopamine is required for movement, coordination. And so when that is impacted, um, people with Parkinson's experience tremors, slowness, rigidity, and that's all what we would say the physical manifestations. Uh, But there's also non-motor symptoms. Um, They experience depression, apathy, anxiety, um, constipation, as well as sleep disorders. Um, There are different symptoms, but also different forms of Parkinson's. Can you share a little bit about that? So when we think about different forms, it's more that we're still trying to understand why some people are diagnosed later in life and typically in their 60s, but we also have early onset Parkinson's. So people as young as 20 and 30s are being diagnosed with Parkinson's. And um, it's kind of right now not common because we really associate it with the elderly. What are researchers learning about early onset Parkinson's? So one of the things that they're learning about early onset is that for some reason, they do typically have slower progression of the disease. So that's kind of interesting in terms of when you're diagnosed later on, um, they see that the pace of progression is a little bit faster than early onset. And so trying to understand why is also really important um, in terms of trying to find those right treatments for people living with Parkinson's. Um, Are there there symptoms, no matter if it's early onset or later in life, that are common across uh, all Parkinson's? Yes, yeah, so they do have the similar um, uh, similarities in terms of the symptoms. Um, it's just that when you're younger, um, because we think older, um, it has been harder for people who are younger to get that diagnosis because of that association as an elderly disease. And what are some of the first symptoms that somebody might notice? So some of the first symptoms may um, be what we call essential tremors or um, a twitching. We've also heard a lot where people are saying their partner will notice or someone, a family member will notice that when they're walking, their arms aren't keeping up with their legs. So that it's being held back and that's related to slowness. So those are some of the first cues of Parkinson's disease. What are researchers learning? I understand this is something that's a a growing area, but about the role of the, the environment, like environmental factors in developing Parkinson's. Yeah, so we still don't know the cause of Parkinson's disease, but a lot of research has been looking into um, environmental factors such as pesticides, herbicides, solvents, um, and their strong linkages to Parkinson's disease. But what we usually are finding out that it's not just one thing, it's probably what we would call the perfect storm. You probably have some genes that have primed you to potentially get Parkinson's, and when the right environment is there, such as potentially those herbicides, pesticides, and solvents, um, that links to the, the onset of Parkinson's disease. There's sort of a group of uh, neurological diseases, Parkinson's, there's also Huntington's, which I know a great deal about because uh, mm-hmm. it's, in, it's in my uh, family, an extended family. But it's also, uh, I know, so what I know about Huntington's is you can be genetically tested for that. Um, Correct. Is, is Parkinson's the same? So unfortunately with Parkinson's, um, only a small percentage have a linkage to a uh, gene. Um, There's a familial gene, but then there's quite a few who no other family members have it. Hmm. So um, it's not as simple as just a gene uh, piece. What are some of the most promising treatments and therapies right now for Parkinson's? So in terms of treatments, right now we only have treatments for symptoms um, and we don't have anything that slows down or stops the disease progression. 
That being said, um, there's a lot of research ongoing right now to find those disease-modifying therapies, including looking at repurposing. So repurposing is taking drugs that are known and being used in other disease states and seeing if that will also help in slowing down uh, disease progression in Parkinson's. What other disease uh, diseases would you look to? Uh, would it be things that also affect motor, you know, um, the, the motor system and the, and the nerve, nerve, the nervous system rather? Well, so what's interesting here is um, uh, newly in the last year, they've noticed that diabetes drugs, um, one that we all have heard about lately in the environment, um, could have some potential to slow down disease progression. Hmm. So it's not just the ones that uh, impact the nervous system, but also looking out, um, we're funding a study that's looking at uh, TB drugs and how that could potentially help in slowing down the progression of Parkinson's. That's fascinating. I think you're probably referring to Ozempic. Now, that's the brand name for a drug that a lot of people have been talking about right now. Correct. Yeah. 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 So now the new research, obviously, you're looking at the potential. This is all very, very much in its infancy phase, all of this. Um, Correct. What would you say to someone listening right now who's concerned about Parkinson's disease in their own family? So we really encourage people to look at parkinson.ca. We have plenty of resources and support to not only in your community, but what's well known across the country and um, internationally. But if you are concerned as well, please go see a doctor, have that conversation, and hopefully they'll be able to guide you and give you that diagnosis so you get immediately the support and interventions right away to live your best quality of life. Anything to add this morning, Karen? I know often when we do, uh, you know, information uh, to where's awareness about diseases, we miss the piece of that uh, people sometimes fixate on the fact that this is something that, of course, it can be devastating for you, but you also live while you have, mm-hmm. you know, these diseases. So I don't know if you want to add something to that vein. I know that we've done stories here about, you know, quality of life and how people are managing to uh, to keep their quality of life up, uh, despite the fact that they're living with, with diseases, including with Parkinson's. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we've really learned over the last few years is that people talk about loss in Parkinson's, but I will share with you what many are also telling us, even though they may be losing they're also gaining. And that's the most important piece, that they're gaining something new that they never thought they would have. And so what we're really trying to do is inspire and empower people to thrive and to show them that it's still possible, even with the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Follow your life where it takes you, right? All right, Karen, thank you so much. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Karen Lee is the president and CEO of Parkinson Canada. We reached her this morning in Toronto. We're having a conversation because today, April 11th, is World Parkinson's Day. It's three minutes to seven o'clock. Heather Wells joins us with local news headlines. Good morning. Well, the owners of the Winnipeg Jets want to help the city reduce homelessness. True North Executive Chair Mark Chipman says he and co-owner David Thompson are talking about creating housing for people who need to transition out of homeless shelters. We'll hear what they have in mind coming up. And uh, a Brandon small business operator has turned to an ombudsman service for banks. After having her bank accounts emptied in a fraud, Nicole Roy says an unknown person took $3,000 from her Bank of Montreal accounts through a fraudulent e-transfer. We'll hear that story as well in our next local news at 7.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. It is four degrees in Winnipeg right now. It is uh, clearing, but there's still some light cloud out there. We can see the blue sky behind it. We have a mix of sun and cloud for most of the morning, a 30% chance of late afternoon showers and a high of 14. And I know as Abby and I were talking about yesterday some parts of the city got real rain just a really quick fast dump maybe around three o'clock or so so we'll see what develops today Uh, on the morning commute things should be fine for you so far 7883093 be careful for pedestrians and increased traffic uh, with cyclists as well speaking of which in the next hour if you're looking to dust off your bike and take it for a spin and you're hoping for a tune-up as uh, you know the thing to do first you might already be in for a bit of a wait. We're going to hear from one Winnipeg bike shop that already has a two-week backlog, so that's coming up. In addition, in the next hour, more on the story Heather just mentioned about the uh, owners of the Winnipeg Jets looking at uh, doing their part and getting into the business of reducing homelessness. So Bartley Kivas is going to be in with, uh, with more details for us as well, so he'll be in studio just before 8 o'clock. And then right after a World Report, Transcona City Councillor Russ Wyatt is being called out for an inappropriate comment he made during a City Hall committee hearing this week, uh, meeting this week rather. Now he's being reported to the City's Integrity Commissioner. So we're going to hear more uh, from him and also uh, what one other City Councillor has to say about it. I'm Marcy Marcusa. World Report is coming up next right here on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or YouTube. It's one minute to seven on your Thursday morning. Stay with us. Today on The Current, 
The uncertainty gnaws at them. The anxiety is as constant as the melting ice. Climate change is altering our oceans, our forests, and our whole world. A group of neurologists now say it may also be changing our brains, our ability to learn, and our mental health. A look at climate and the brain coming up on The Current. The Current with Matt Galloway. This morning at 837, 907 in Newfoundland, and on the CBC Listen app. This is World Report. Good morning. I'm Marcia Young. Shareholders of Canada's biggest bank are gathering today for their annual general meeting. The Royal Bank of Canada is facing criticism for its support of fossil fuel projects. One report last year named RBC the world's biggest fossil fuel financier. As Thomas Daigle reports, activists are demanding the bank divest. In the heart of Toronto's financial district, dozens marched ahead of the Royal Bank's big meeting. We want their shareholders to know that they need to hold their executives accountable. Crystal Cavalier from the Okanichi Band of the Suponi Nation is fighting a major natural gas pipeline near her South Carolina home, a project financed in part by RBC. We are here to tell them that they didn't get consent from our people. Recently, the bank bowed to pressure and agreed to start disclosing the ratio of money it puts into clean energy projects compared to fossil fuel extraction. But that should only be the start, says Tara Hauska from Kuchiching First Nation. They know they have a serious problem. They know that their shareholders care about this. In a statement to CBC News, the bank says it's working with clients and communities to help transition to a greener economy and intends to triple lending for renewable energy by 2030. Olaf Weber researches the financial industry and sustainable development and says it's not only RBC. Because it's a Canadian situation. Canadian banks are relatively high compared to others. Canada has a high ratio of, of fossil fuels. It's a reality that demonstrators say isn't changing fast enough. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Closing arguments will be made today in the sexual assault case of retired Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson. He's accused of assaulting a subordinate on board a Canadian Navy ship over 30 years ago. Kayla Hounsell has been covering the trial. She still believes absolutely it was the right thing to do, and she's looking forward to seeing this process to the end. Paul Champ represents the woman accusing retired Vice Admiral Hayden Edmondson of sexual assault. In February, she told an Ottawa court she was deployed on a Navy ship in 1991 when Edmondson first exposed himself, and she testified, raped her days later. He was a senior officer. She was just 19. Champ applauds his client's strength. She did extremely well in her testimony, but there's no question that uh, the emotional toll was was far greater than, than even she had imagined. Edmondson is facing one count of sexual assault and one count of committing indecent acts. He has pleaded not guilty and testified he did not have any kind of sexual contact with the woman. He was one of several high-ranking military members accused of sexual misconduct in 2021. It's even impressive that the trial came to be, actually. Charlotte Duval-Antoine is with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and studies gender integration in the Canadian forces. She says regardless of the outcome, this is a significant moment. I I think that it is important to, to see that we're still seeing a change because we don't know what would have happened if she had come forward 30 years ago. Edmondson is being tried by judge alone in civilian court. The judge has not said when he will deliver his verdict. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Ottawa. Ontario says it plans to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in the province. A private member's bill was tabled yesterday by the opposition NDP. It calls for the declaration and return with recommendations. It passed second reading in the Ontario legislature last night. The support marks a change for Premier Doug Ford's PC government. Ford rejected a move to declare an epidemic nearly a year ago. The bill will now go to a legislative committee for further study. The United States is trying to dial down the temperature on threats between Israel and Iran. Washington is asking Iran's neighbors to try to stop those threats from escalating. Abby Kowalasan has the details. When a message of revenge came from Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei that Israel will be punished, U.S. President Joe Biden shot back an equally strong warning. Our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies 
is ironclad. Professor Roxanne Farman Farmayan is with the University of Cambridge and says a possible retaliation is getting quite a bit of coverage. I think that there is a, a certain amount of interest on the part of the U.S., on Biden's part, to deflect some of the story away from the Gaza war. Tehran's threats follow the killing of several Iranians, including a top commander, Mohammad Reza Zahidi, in Syria last week. Israel has not publicly claimed responsibility, but it is widely believed Israeli warplanes targeted the Iranian consulate building, which is now reopened. Farman Farmayan says Iran does not want direct confrontation. I think it is very likely that it would hit Israel on Israeli territory. After all, the attack on the Iranian consulate was not in Iran. A strike could also come from one of Iran's proxies, like Hezbollah, which dominates southern Lebanon. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has spoken to his Israeli counterpart Yoav Gallant on possible threats. And the White House's Middle East are called up neighboring countries, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar, to ask their top diplomats to urge Tehran to de-escalate. Iran's foreign ministry confirmed regional tensions were recently discussed with those same nations. Abby Kovas in CBC News, London. There are reports in Israeli media the IDF forces responsible for killing the three sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh did not consult senior commanders. The reports say the young men were targeted as fighters. They say Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was not informed before they were targeted in an airstrike. The Israeli military has not commented on Hamas's claim that Four of Hania's grandchildren were also killed in the attack. There's protesting in the streets of Manila this morning. People are ripping the U.S. flag and shouting anti-war slogans. They're unhappy about a trilateral meeting at the White House today. It includes their country's president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., along with U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. The meeting is expected to focus on the common concerns over China and creating a regional alliance. But organizers of the Manila protests say the summit will lead to increased foreign military buildup in the Philippines and an escalation of conflict in the region. The Trudeau government is preparing to release its latest budget with a wave of new announcements. But a new poll from the Angus Reid Institute suggests the majority of Canadians are concerned the government is spending too much. Three out of five Canadians polled said federal finances have ballooned. But there are some areas where they do not want to see cuts. Two-thirds of people polled called for more investment in health care, and about half were in favor of spending more on national defense. Alberta used to have the highest minimum wage in the country. Now, six years later, that $15 wage is the second lowest in the country. But Alberta is the wealthiest province in Canada. And Karina Zapata tells us that advocates say it's time for another increase. I literally can't afford to go out or treat myself. Um, so it does take a hit mentally. University of Calgary student Colena Brittner is one of the 126,000 Albertans making $15 an hour as Alberta's inflation rate rises above the national average. But it isn't just students struggling with rising costs. Alberta's most recent minimum wage profile shows 41% of minimum wage earners have children. It's just hard and stressful. Most provinces and territories are raising their minimum wage this year. In Ontario, it's adjusting to inflation to 17.20 in October and 17.40 in British Columbia in June. But in Alberta, the minimum wage has been held at $15 an hour since 2018. Megan Reed with poverty reduction group Vibrant Communities Calgary says it's a far cry from Calgary's living wage, which sits at 23.70. I think it's only uh, a matter of time before we really see the mental health effects of uh, this economic crisis start to weigh on people. In a statement to CBC, Alberta's government says it understands the pressures Albertans are facing, but raising the minimum wage could have impacts on the economy. Calgary economist Mike Holden says that can be prevented by warning businesses in advance and increasing the wage slowly. If you create more inflation, then you're you're just perpetuating the problem you're trying to solve. The province says it's constantly evaluating Alberta's minimum wage. Karina Zapata, CBC News, Calgary. I ain't working for minimum wage no more. I ain't working and this is someone who knows all about working for minimum wage. Terry McLeish is from the Upper Ottawa Valley. 
He has worked as a grocery boy, farmhand, and golf course greensman. Well, have been a fireman, sliding down a pole, or a golf pro like old Tiger Woods. That is the latest national and international news from World Report. I'm Marcia Young. Rolling in the dough. I ain't working for minimum wage no more. It's the happiest song about being underpaid you'll ever hear. <laughs> it is 7, 10 a.m. on 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. around the app. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcy Marcusa. Thanks for joining us here on Information Radio for your Thursday morning. You might be on 89.3 FM, as mentioned, 9.90 a.m., but also on the app or YouTube. So good morning to everybody watching. Uh, not bad out there. Four degrees. Abby's going to update that in a moment and tell us about the rest of the day here in Winnipeg. In addition, this hour on the show, we're going to talk a little bit about spring and springtime weather. You might be looking to dust off your old bike and start with a tune-up before you hit the road, but you might already find a lineup. One Winnipeg bike shop says they already have a two-week backlog, so we'll hear about that. Also, it's been a very successful season for the Winnipeg Jets, and now the Jets owners are looking at ways to help the city succeed in reducing homelessness. Our CBC senior reporter, Bartley Kivas, will join us in studio to talk more about what Mark Chipman and David Thompson are planning. Right now, though, Heather Wells is in with other headlines. Good morning. Good morning. Well, the city of Winnipeg is looking into the cost of weekly trash cleanups at encampments. According to a new report, there are 150 homeless camp encampments spread out across the city right now. And cleanups last year cost taxpayers nearly $84,000. This report says providing weekly cleanups to all encampments would cost around $4 million. A Clear Lake lodging order owner says the talk of a boating ban has already led some people to cancel their stays in Clear Lake. Ashley Smith opened Turtle Village and Clear Lake Fishing Village last year. She worries for the survival of her business if the government decides to close the lake to watercraft to protect it from invasive zebra mussels. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 7.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Abby, yesterday I went in. It's a sign of the uh, weather and the times I was trying to. I have those tents, you know, that cover your. Uh, shrubs yep. to keep them safe instead of wrapping with burlap. I have those things you mm -hmm. buy and pop on. And I was trying to pull one off, but I guess that the feet of it are still frozen into the soil. Oh, just a reminder, it's not thawed underneath there yet, of course. But I'm just getting, I'm just itching, just yeah. itching for some H gardening. Hang in there, hang in there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost here, like probably... Maybe around after the 19th, you can uh, focus on that. I know. over the, But for sure, I'm going to be able to get those tents off. A few of them came off. Uh, it's just a couple of them were stuck. But if oh. we get these 20s by the weekend, it'll... it'll yeah, once we hit the 20s up. by the weekend, I know that's where we're heading. But for right now, we're still targeting 14 and 16s across the province. Currently in Winnipeg, we are mild at 4 degrees. It's partly cloudy. It's trying to clear up because uh, today we're going to see more of a, that dance of uh, a mix of sun and clouds throughout the day with possibility of showers later on. Now, the temperature is going to climb to a comfy 14 degrees in the city today. Tonight, we'll see some clouds clearing later and then a slight chance of that shower. Some parts of the city would get, some other part of the city would get it later in the evening and the conditions would improve as the night goes on. Now, across the province, temperatures are varying. In Brandon, it's uh, 2 degrees right now. A chance of showers. I can see, uh, you know, checking the tracker here. I see some, uh, you know, some, some rain of uh, uh, above uh, uh, Verdon right now. But uh, Brandon is currently at uh, two degrees. Chance of shower for you. Thompson sits at zero with mainly cloudy skies and a chance of flurries or rain later. Churchill is at minus three with mostly cloudy skies and some flurries. Dauphin, Gimli, Steinbach, and Morris. All will see temperatures between 2 and 4 degrees with a mix of sun and clouds and also possible showers. It's like that's what uh, the forecast has for the province today. But right now in the city, we are sitting at 4 degrees and it is mild outside. All right. Thanks, Abby. You're welcome. Uh, Dylan Longhurst is filling in for Corey and has our commute details. Hi. Hey, Marcy. Yeah, it's been a quiet, lovely Thursday morning commute. Not much, really much going out there, uh, going on out there on the roads. We haven't heard of many problem spots slowing people down today. Lovely day to get out if you're an active commuter, if you're walking, biking, busing. Nice day to be out there. Should get nicer as the day goes on. Yeah, if you see anything out there, though, we'd love to hear what's happening out there on the roads. Give us a call, 204-788-3093.
Well, a flag that our first story this half hour is about an inappropriate comment made by Winnipeg City Councillor Russ Wyatt. He is now in hot water for name-calling a bike advocate during a public work standing committee meeting this week. So uh, we've warned you here as to what he said. I think that is the issue for the average people who don't show up at the committee. I realize the bicycle boss who wants to take away all the links in the cars, but well, you're going to have an I mean, you're going to have an east west lane. That, uh... So his comment was made during a meeting on Tuesday, where the committee discussed how to calm Osborne Street traffic to prevent a high number of pedestrian and cyclist deaths. Mark Coho, executive director of Bike Winnipeg, was at the meeting to advocate for pedestrian and cyclist safety. Bike Winnipeg is calling for Wyatt's removal from a public works standing committee, saying his comment violated the city council's code of conduct. Mayor Scott Gillingham called the comments inappropriate. Wyatt admits it was a, quote, poor choice of words, end quote, saying he said them out of a sense of frustration. Here is more of what he said to reporters. Uh, the, when, I, when I said that, it's out of frustration. A number of us councillors have been advocating for bike paths to be built, but you know things like the extension of the Transcom Trail, the completion of uh, the North Winnipeg Parkway, trails that make things safer. And what's frustrating is to hear Bike Winnipeg not re- necessarily representing those projects when they come forward, but want to represent closing of lanes to cars such as shutting down Assiniboine Avenue at Main Street or removing the lane in Osborne Village, the, the slip lane they call it, onto River. When those were agreements that were made years ago when that development took place to accommodate that lane. And so I hear from my constituents, they want dedicated paths that are safe, extensions to existing paths, connections that we're missing all over the city. And that's what's frustrating, I think, for a lot of us down here. I hear your frustration, but do you feel that it's appropriate to use the word Nazi? Well, I, I, guess, I guess the term Nazi means a, a dictator, to tell you how you're going to live your life, right? And that's really what it's coming down to. You hear from them speaking in the committee, they're saying, this is how we think people should live their life, right? They shouldn't be using their car, they have to use a bike, right? And really, they're taking lanes away, shutting down roads, saying, you know, I cycle, everybody else should be doing that. Well, that's not, that's not how the, the world works, and that's not how Winnipeg works, for good or bad, right? And so maybe that was the term I used. I'm going to think about whether I apologize or not. And if I do so, I'll do it in writing. And I definitely will take the mayor's advice under advisement. But at this point, uh, the frustration that we all feel down here is a lot of us have been advocating for bike paths, extension of bike paths, connections, you know, over major roadways where people are taking their life in their hand to get across. These are the things that we need Bike Winnipeg to be speaking up on, right? And we're not hearing it. We're only hearing from a certain group who seem to be, I guess, running the organization, who represent a certain percentage or a certain group in the city who want certain lanes closed to cars. And that's, and that's not what we're hearing from folks out there. The rest of the biking Winnipeg community, people who bike all the time with their kids and their families, and those people and their concerns seem to be going underrepresented right now with Bike Winnipeg. Now, late yesterday, we understand why it issued a different statement apologizing for his comment, although you didn't hear it there. Uh, he did say it was not directed at one person, and it was, quote, a very poor choice of words, which I regret and do wish to humbly apologize for, end quote. But meantime, Waverly West Councillor Janice Lukes, who chairs the Public Works Committee, says she is going to file a report about why it's comment to the city's integrity commissioner. Here's a bit when from you her. When you chair one of these committee meetings, there's a lot on the go. You're dealing with public works, you're dealing with counselors, you're dealing with emails, you're dealing with um, your phone that people are texting. There's a lot of, lot of moving parts. I missed it, and I feel horrible that I missed it. I didn't hear it. Uh, I don't want to say I tune them out sometimes, but <laughs> I guess I'm going to say that. But I, I completely missed it, and it's totally unacceptable. Like, it's crazy. I got involved in cycling. Uh, when my kids are born, do I, you know, like, would I, do I want to be called something like that? Like, does anyone want to be called something like that? That's, it's, it's unacceptable. So, yes, I feel bad that I wasn't listening and that I missed it. Um, and I'm filing a report to the Integrity Commissioner um, because it's not acceptable. Um, this report, what, what, how does that process work? Well, we have an integrity commissioner, and um, I'll file a complaint, and then she'll, it'll go through a process, and she'll deal with him. Um, I don't know the whole detail of what she'll deal with him on, but there is a process that we've got set up, and uh, it's unacceptable. 
Or do you support any calls to, to remove him from the public works committee? <laughs> Well, he doesn't show up half the time, so um, uh, do I want to remove him from the committee? Well, I've not even thought about that, but, you know, the I don't think we can actually do that here. I mean, we can call for him to be removed, but uh, I, we don't, from the governance model, we don't have that in place. So I think dealing with the integrity commissioner, uh, he may have to make a public apology. I'd like to see him make a public apology. And... Um, yeah, I, I, it's just unacceptable. Um, this process with the Integrity Commissioner, what could some of those outcomes be? Well, again, I think that depending on how she approaches it or depending, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know her processes for something, an issue like this, but I would suspect she would request that he make a public apology if he hasn't by the time she's processed the paperwork and she's processed and spoken with him. I would like to think he'd take it upon himself to make a public apology, um, but uh, everyone's their own individual, right? So there were some updates on this story since we heard from Janice Lukes. Uh, that is Janice Lukes. She chairs the Public Works Committee weighing in. She says she is going to file a report about why it's comment to the city's integrity commissioner. The update, as I alluded to, uh, between the pieces of tape there, uh, were late in the day why it issued a statement apologizing for his comment. Uh, he also said he was not aware of Luke's plan to file a complaint to the integrity commissioner, but he said he would welcome any investigation at any time. Now, of course, all of this is about you. Uh, it's about you as uh, Winnipeggers. These are your city councillors. Uh, so we're wondering about your expectation of integrity from public officials and how this situation is sitting with you. 7883205, 7883205, if you're listening and you want to weigh in. Earth Day at Fort White Alive is a magical time, and this one is for the birds. Let's celebrate not by looking at the earth below, but by looking up to the skies at our feathered friends who make this place so special. I'm Bryce Hoy. Join me for a virtual bird tour. Come to Fort White Alive's Earth Day celebration April 21st and follow the posted QR codes to learn some amazing bird facts. Visit cbc.ca slash manitoba slash community for more. Birds are a topic of discussion at the Masters, uh, so we'll hear about that in a couple of minutes when we have morning sports coming up. Right now, though, uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, spring has been rather with us for just a couple of weeks now, and J.J. Wilde has a song that's perfect for the season. According to her, it's about the feeling of the sun on your face and a warm breeze kissing your cheek. We'll see if she's captured it in this tune. This is J.J. Wilde. The song's called Arizona on CBC. Weaving in the fast lane, steady pushing 98. All the red I'm passing, hits me and it's getting late.
Scott, we're giving you a big lead in with this tune. I was thinking, you're looking at my script. That, that's perfect segue for where we're going on this. <laughs> well, you can thank Kitchener, Ontario's J.J. Wild for that tune at Arizona. What a big build, right? Yeah, very uh, nice. So let's get started with morning sports. As you can hear, Scott Regari is here. Yeah, uh, busy time in hockey right now, uh, in part, Marcy, because we have the Women's World Championship playoffs starting today. Canada taking on Sweden, a country which has proven itself far from the soft touch it once was. Remember, uh, at last year's Worlds, the Swedes forced overtime before Canada eventually won that game. So we'll wait and see what happens there. Uh, as for the NHL and our segue, uh, quite a challenge for the Arizona Coyotes last night. They were trying to win in Vancouver. Vancouver, where the Canucks have been one of the league's best teams, and the Coyotes were doing it on the same day. Reports surfaced that the NHL, yes, has drafted a schedule that would see them relocated to Salt Lake City next season. Adversity? What adversity? The Coyotes beat Vancouver in overtime on a goal by this guy, Logan Cooley. With all the news going around and, you know, going, it's, you know, we just put the rest of the side, just had fun, and, you know, it paid off, and it was a heck of a game. It was you know, one of the most fun games I think we played in this year. If the Coyotes do relocate to Utah, Marcy, they're going to have to move quickly. The last time a team switched cities, <clears throat> when the Thrashers moved from Atlanta to Winnipeg in 2011, that happened in May. Tick tock, tick tock. Mm -hmm. At least the Coyotes have not complicated matters by, you know, making the playoffs. Um, Winnipeg, meanwhile, current version, uh, the Jets are going to make the playoffs, but can they win the Central Division? If so, they're going to have to win tonight in regulation against uh, one of their Central Division foes, Dallas. Puck drop at 7 o'clock. Let's go to baseball. The Jays uh, failed to sweep Seattle, thanks largely to one player, really. Yeah, that player being the Mariners catcher, Cal Raleigh, Marcy. He may not be a superstar, but that's only in the case against teams not based in Toronto. Uh, Raleigh hit the game-clinching homer in extra innings. So in 17 contests against the Jays, uh, he's now hit 10 home runs, including a huge one in a wild card game back in 2022. Now, when John Schneider, the Jays manager, was asked about Raleigh's success against his team last year, this is what Schneider said. He's not very tough to pitch to when you execute your pitches. I know he's done damage against us. He's obviously got big damage potential, and he's got a lot of strikeout potential, too. And when you execute your pitches, you usually get the job done. Okay, so that's what John Schneider said last year about uh, Raleigh. Here's what he said yesterday. Maybe he's part Canadian, you know, it, it, you, you tip your hat to him, you know what I mean? It's, um, he likes hitting here, he likes hitting against us, so, yeah, he's, he's got our number. <laughs> uh, a change of tune there. Yep. Asked about John Schneider, Rally told reporters yesterday, a lot of guys have a beef with him, you don't have to say anything, if you don't have anything nice to say, you don't say anything at all unless you want it to come back and haunt you. So a case of uh, a Jay eating crow today. Let's finish with golf, where birds are a topic of discussion as well, I guess, as the Masters gets underway. <laughs> That's about all that's going on. Are those uh, yeah, brown thrashers, Carolina wrens, perhaps, maybe northern mockingbirds? Or maybe, Nar Marcy, it's none of the above, because conspiracy theorists uh, are maintaining not for the first time, that CBS is piping in Erzatz bird songs in order to enhance the feel of golf's most prestigious event, a soundtrack to accompany those beautiful magnolias and azaleas. Uh, it's not like there is not precedent for this either. CBS was caught using fake bird sound effects at another major at the PGA Championship uh, several years back. All of this should not detract, though, from a tournament this year with several compelling storylines. Can Corey Connors or Nick Taylor became the second Canadian ever after Mike Weir to claim the green jacket? Can Rory McIlroy uh, win the only big tournament he hasn't won in his career? And can Tiger Woods somehow forge his way to his sixth career Masters title? He has age. He's almost 50. Health. Pretty much his entire body has been surgically repaired. And potentially weather working against him, as you alluded to, it is raining in Augusta. That's forced tea times to be pushed back. Can you imagine, Marcy, Tiger having to make up an extra round tomorrow, potentially hobbling up and down 36 holes? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, not, nor can I. It hurts to even imagine. <laughs> At least we'll have the beautiful bird sounds uh, to ease that pain. Scott, Maybe thank, not Tiger. thank yeah, you. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Your CBC Winnipeg News is next. 
This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg at 7.30. It is 4 degrees. Uh, we're going to be a day a lot like yesterday was. A mix of sun and clouds and a high of 14 with, again, a chance of showers today. The owners of the Winnipeg Jets want to help this city reduce homelessness. True North Executive Chair Mark Chipman says he and co-owner David Thompson are talking about creating housing for people who need transition out of homeless shelters. People with a history of homelessness and addictions often need help finding and keeping a home. Chipman says there aren't enough housing options to meet those needs in Winnipeg. We're stuck with a lack of transitionary housing. There are lots that are trying and some that have been successful. But that's where his interest lies, is in how do we expand more capacity in that realm. Chipman and Thompson met with Winnipeg's mayor and premier about housing in December. Premier Wab Canoe says their real estate and business insight can complement the work of governments and nonprofit organizations. You can hear more on this story coming up in the next half hour right here on Information Radio. The city of Winnipeg is looking into the cost of weekly trash cleanups at encampments. According to a new report, there are some 150 homeless camps spread out across the city right now. Cleanups last year cost taxpayers nearly $84,000. This report says providing weekly cleanups to all encampments would cost around $4 million. Mayor Scott Gillingham says the Executive Policy Committee will discuss it next week. Cabinets can be dangerous. They can be, frankly, unsightly. Uh, and, and for people that live in proximity to an encampment, there are concerns. Gillingham says while encampments need to be cleaned up, more work needs to be done to house people with wraparound supports. A Brandon woman says she has lost faith in the banking system after someone cleaned out her bank accounts with a fraudulent e-transfer. Nicole Roy says she lost $3,000 from her accounts at a Bank of Montreal branch last fall. Right away, the teller said that there's no way that this could have happened without me giving out my card and my PIN number to someone. So right from the very beginning, I really felt like, oh no, you know, like... I got the indication that this was not going to go my way. Roy says she has never given anyone her PIN or her BMO bank card. She says the bank gave her $500 as a goodwill gesture, but she's still trying to recover the rest of her money. She has filed a complaint with the National Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investments, but Roy isn't optimistic that will help because only about a quarter of banking complaints filed last year resulted in monetary compensation to the complainant. Shareholders of Canada's biggest bank are gathering today for their annual general meeting. The Royal Bank of Canada is facing criticism for its support of fossil fuel projects. One report last year named RBC the world's biggest fossil fuel financier. The Ontario government is a step closer to formally declaring intimate partner violence an epidemic in that province. A private member's bill tabled by the opposition NDP passed second reading in the legislature last night, marking an about face for Premier Doug Ford's PC government, which a year ago rejected a call, call to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. The bill will now go to a legislative committee for further study. You can hear more national and international news coming up on World Report at 8. A Clear Lake lodging owner says talk of a boating ban has already led some people to cancel their stays. Ashley Smith opened Turtle Village in Clear Lake Fishing Village last year. She worries about how she'll be able to s sustain her young business if the federal government bans watercraft over fears of invasive zebra mussels. Smith was happy to hear Premier Wab Canoe call on Ottawa to avoid banning boats. We as people have to be a solution. And it's not keeping people away. That's not the solution. We all have the right to use the land and the water freely here in Canada. Parks Canada says banning watercraft is one of the options it is considering after live zebra mussels were found in Clear Lake late last year. The Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is asking people to destroy a collectible set sold at their music stand because it has toxic levels of lead. Health Canada has issued a recall on tranquility and teachings sets from the Canadian Art Prince Indigenous Collection. The plates feature artwork by painter William Montague. 
The WSO says it's accepting recalls on all of the plate sets out of an abundance of caution. It's going to remove the product from its inventory and post recall notices at upcoming concerts. The WSO asks anyone who has bought those plates to immediately stop using them. Health Canada says as of late last month, almost 1,500 plates had been sold in Canada. You can find more news updated throughout the day. Just head to cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. Well, let's check in on the weather forecast. Uh, There is, well, a lot of cloud cover that's now moved into the downtown, Abby. Yes, lots of cloud cover. Looks like uh, the fluffy cotton we always refer to. It's still uh, four degrees in the city, partly cloudy, as Mercy mentioned, painting that beautiful morning scene in the city. And, you know, on my uh, app, my weather app, one of the apps I use would give you like um, a forecast of when to take um, pictures of sunrise and sunsets and morning photos yep. and uh, evening photos and it's telling me now that hey it's a good time to go outside and capture the sky I'm like, nice i'm like okay yeah i see that but i'm busy <laughs> <laughs> hang on astronomy app i'm on live radio i'm busy <laughs> Anyway, as the day progresses, the forecast has a mix of sun, sunshine and clouds with a chance of showers later on, accompanied by that northwest winds that I made mention of. It's going to be picking up later now. Despite the rain possibility that we might be seeing, the temperatures are going to be climbing to a comfortable 14 degrees. Tonight in Winnipeg, we'll see gradual clearing and then that you know, cloudy cover will leave us, but there's still a slight chance of early evening showers. If we travel across the province, Brandon is currently at 2 degrees. We'll be seeing a mix of sun and clouds very, very soon. And then a chance of showers in the afternoon. It's zero in Thompson. Expect mainly cloudy conditions and then possible flurries or rain showers. For folks in Churchill, it's minus 3. You will experience mostly cloudy skies and flurries. And then the gusty winds would accompany that. Dauphin, Gimli, Steinbeck and Maurice at 2's threes and fours. That's what you'll be seeing with a mix of sun and clouds and a chance of showers in the afternoon. That's what it looks like across the province, mostly con- uh, cloudy. And maybe I can go outside and take the photos now. Well, maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> you're going to have to leave the downtown. So I don't think you'll be back in time before you're on air a lot again. Uh, uh, maybe Dylan will have to cover for you because he's so. he's got the easier jo- uh, job today. It's been really quiet in the D- traffic. Dylan, eh? honestly, we love you. We Curry also gets the drought of uh, traffic calls. I feel like I'm getting <laughs> bad news here. <laughs> it's, it's not just you, why people aren't calling is Abby's point, but it has been really quiet, eh? Yeah, no, that traffic line has not really been going off today, and you know what? That's a good thing. Uh, me being a little bit bored and you getting to where you want to go with minimal delays, probably a good trade-off. Uh, yeah, Meter line has not been ringing off the hook. So far, we don't really know of any problem spots that are slowing people down, but of course, if that's not the situation for you, if you're sitting in traffic wondering why no one's talking about that one slow road you know, give us a call. Let us know what you're seeing out there. 204-788-3093. Thank you, Dylan. Dylan Longhurst filling in for Corey Funk this morning. Well, speaking of commuting. <laughs> that is the sound of spring over at Natural Cycle Works in the Exchange District. I love that sound taking away the spokes. If this warmer weather has you thinking about taking your bike in for a tune-up and getting ready to hit the road, you're not alone. It is very busy, though, for bike shops across the city, and as you're about to hear, Natural Cycle Works is no exception. Co-owner Maddie Adair showed CBC's Corey Funk where all the bikes waiting to be worked on are hanging up, and space was tight. Uh, Right now, so I'm looking at, like, a big... Line up, I don't know how many bikes are. I would guess, like, how many are there? About 72 bikes right now in for repair for the next two weeks. Okay, that's your, like, backlog of bikes right now. Yeah, yeah, Wild. yeah. Um, um, and they're all, like, uh, heavily assessed, and all the assessments are tied to a, a minute number, and that's how we book. So, you know, um, and every once in a while you find something really surprising on a bike, and that's going to take a little bit of time, and so sometimes that's why your bike doesn't get back to you as fast as possible but we quality control everything so that when you do get it back, you don't have any issues. <laughs> and is this a typical amount of bikes you kind of got hanging up this time of year? For the beginning of the season, yeah, this normally runs fully booked up for about 70-something bikes for about a couple months at a time. Yeah. So it's uh, the sun is shining and bikes are rolling. 
So are when people call, are you kind of like, oh, like you, you got to wait at least two weeks, and the people book in, or are they like, well, or you have to, or they go look somewhere else, or what? Well, uh, so when people call and they're like, hey, I, I need my bike tuned up uh, as soon as possible, um, we give them the unfortunate news that it might be a couple weeks, but if they stop by, we can give them a free assessment and go from there. If it's a flat tire, we always do that same day. If it's anything more, um, then we book it in accordingly. But uh, we always ask that people stop by just to make sure that we have all the parts for them because there's so many different bikes out there now. Yeah. So when people come by, especially in spring, to get their bike fixed, what kind of condition often do they, do they come in at? Filthy, <laughs> uh, within reason, um, because our weather is back and forth throughout the day at the beginning of the season. Uh, it gets slushy in the morning, gets uh, dry in the evening, so a lot of that dirt gets baked onto your bike. And in turn, we have to do a lot of cleaning before we even start working on it, which... Uh, for us, uh, we wash all our bikes by hand in the stand because we are in a historic building that doesn't allow to do a lot of um, renovations for for that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we ask that people, you know, give the bike a good wipe down. How much time do you spend just washing bikes this time of year? Um, a good 10% of every tune is cleaning the bike up, making sure you can see every nook and cranny and see what the issues are see what the see what the problems are the root problems of these issues if, if you want some like quick and prompt service and you have that assessment go by really smooth just give your bike a wipe down clean it up you know get the cobwebs out of the wheels get the mud off of the pedals and uh that'll make the process a lot smoother are you noticing like some people got pandemic puppies uh, is there people who got pandemic bikes and are now like, oh shoot, like I, I need this thing kind of fixed up or like I've put it to the side now that kind of things are more or less like, you know, pre pandemic vibes. Yeah. There's a lot of that. A lot of, um, oh, I just got into cycling and I bought a bike during COVID. Um, now, and now it's been also sitting since I've been going back to work. Mm -hmm. So, um, and last year, uh, cycling season was very short. So a lot of people didn't even pull out their bikes. So, a lot of thing, a lot of bikes that we're seeing now are have been sitting for a year or two, um, or a lot longer. Um, uh, so that creates a lot of uh, a lot of business. I mean, what do you love about cycling in Winnipeg in particular? Uh, really, just the community. Um, everyone almost always seems to be in a good mood when they're on their bike, even if their bike is broken and they come in. They're generally in a good mood. And that's because everyone's getting exercise during the sun. And how long have you been working here at Natural Cycle? I've been working with the company on and off for almost 10 years. Um, I've been working in the bike shop uh, section of Natural uh, for the last four and a bit. So 10 years. What have you noticed about Winnipeg cycling community, how it's changed over the past 10 years? Um, it's definitely getting more close-knit. It seems like a lot of... You know, fun cycling groups and bike shop cycling groups are all kind of hanging out and and creating like community workshops and um, and events and stuff. So it's a it's a, the cycling scene in Winnipeg is is quite awesome. Is it growing? Definitely growing. Uh, there's far more cyclists out on the road ever since COVID too. Um, quite a quite a massive number of of bikes out there and people wanting to cycle people wanting to get active and it's great that's Matty Adair, co-owner of Natural Cycle Works in the Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg's Exchange District. He was speaking there with CBC's Corey Funk. Corey headed out yesterday to find out what it's like if you're looking to get your bike tuned up and you want to hit the road. And as you heard, there is already a bike log. So uh, a bike log, a backlog, <laughs> or I guess you could call it a bike log. So you might want to uh, call ahead if you're planning on heading out somewhere and uh, getting ready. Now, while we're on the topic of cycling, let's switch gears. That one was intentional for a moment. Uh, as you might have heard uh, earlier in the program, uh, to serious matters, Russ Wyatt has now been called out, the city councillor, for an inappropriate comment he made during a city hall committee meeting this week. Now, another councillor has plans to report him to the city's integrity commissioner. I apologize for the offensive language, but uh, Russ Wyatt characterized an advocate as a, quote, 
Spike Nazi. He has since apologized as well late in the day yesterday after first uh, not issuing an apology. Uh, Late in the day, he said it was not directed at one person and was, quote, a very poor choice of words, which I regret and do wish to humbly apologize for, end quote. Now, this all happened during a meeting Tuesday where the committee was discussing how to calm Osborne Street traffic to prevent a high number of pedestrian and cyclist deaths. Mike Winnipeg is calling now for Russ Wyatt's removal from the Public Works Standing Committee, saying his comment violated the city's council's, city council's code of conduct. Now, there's a couple of things at play here. There's, of course, the initial issues that are going on around what was being discussed about safety in the neighbourhood and sharing the roads. And then there's, of course, uh, the integrity and what you expect from councillors. So we asked what you think. Here's some listener lines that came in this morning. Regarding um, the uh, bicycle uh, situation and so on, um, Wyatt has apologized. Um, And the thing about the bicycle uh, uh, lobbyists uh, is that not everyone can hop on a bike. Some people uh, really need private vehicles especially people with some uh, medical conditions and so on, uh, and they need access to get uh, from their homes to wherever they have to go in the city and to keep blocking lanes. um, uh, Have they considered, for example, the need for ambulances and and, uh, uh, fire trucks and, and other emergency vehicles to be able to get down particular streets, Uh, you know, cars and and bicycles uh, have to move to the right uh, to allow for access. And I don't think they're they're considering anyone except themselves, these people who really want nothing but bicycles uh, in the city. Good morning. I'm just listening to the whole thing about the Bike Winnipeg comment from Councillor Russ Wyatt. And You know what? I have absolutely no respect for someone who's using language like that. I think it is totally inappropriate. My comment is towards the actual bike Winnipeg thing. And as someone who lives in a place where they completely block off the street for summer and they put the speed limit down to 30 and they basically expect no one to drive on our our thoroughfare on Lindale Drive, it is so frustrating. We have beautiful bike paths. We have a beautiful street And lots of people in our neighborhood enjoy it. But people do have to get to work. And it causes so much strife amongst our neighbors and people who sit there and give people the finger as they drive by. And this idea that people don't drive, it, it is not something that we can, you know, expect from Winnipeggers. Maybe I'm just venting, but I can't disagree with the sentiment of, you know, bike Winnipeg expecting everyone to hop on a bike and nobody to drive. It's the season of sharing the road. If you want to weigh in, 788-3205. For breaking news as it happens, stay with CBC News. For the latest updates and what it means for Canadians, stay with CBC News. When the biggest stories break, both at home and around the world, stay with CBC News. Right now, it is 12 minutes to 8 o'clock on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Marcy Marcusa, and coming up on the program after 8 o'clock, as you heard yesterday, Parks Canada is considering a ban on boats in Clear Lake this summer to help stop the spread of zebra mussels. Uh, so yesterday, we uh, talked about the uh, the lake, the health of the lake, zebra mussels, how they spread. Today, we're going to talk about economic impact should this happen. Uh, you might have heard there's some business owners weighing in on the news. We're going to talk to them for a full interview after 8. Right now, speaking of business, the Winnipeg Jets are having another good season. They are heading to the playoffs. Outside Canada Life Centre, there are fewer obvious signs of success, though. For many years, the owners of the Jets have engaged in efforts to change that. Some of them quiet, like investing money for a homeless shelter. Now, some of them less quiet, like the Portage Place redevelopment. CBC reporter Bartley Kivas is here to tell us about something else that Mark Chipman and David Thompson are now planning. Good morning, Bartley. Uh, buenos dias, Marcia. ¿Cómo está? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you very much for using my proper name, Marcia. Not a lot of people know that. I did not know that was your proper name. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it was just a guess. Oh, good guess. And you're correct. Uh, let's get into this here. So what have the owners of the Winnipeg Jets done differently, first of all, uh, from other NHL owners? Well, Winnipeg's an unusual NHL market. It's the smallest market in the league. And it's also likely the least affluent market. There's a lot of social disparity and a lot of social issues. Now, this disparity has grown in recent years. Since the start of the pandemic, it's been a lot easier to see how many Winnipeggers downtown are suffering from homelessness, addictions, poor mental health, combinations of those. This led Mark Chipman, the executive chair of True North Sports and Entertainment, to make this now very well-known comment in 2022. What used to be less obvious can now be seen everywhere you look. And it's no longer isolated to our downtown. To be very honest, it's gone long past just being heartbreaking. It's become, uh, in my humble opinion, a humanitarian crisis. Now, Chipman raised some eyebrows with that statement. Some Winnipeggers might have questioned whether he was talking about the need to help people or the need to protect his asset, the Winnipeg Jets, Canada Life Centre, and, and the real estate development around the hockey team and the hockey arena. But Chipman also put money where his mouth was. He quietly helped get a homeless shelter in South Point Douglas off the ground. He's funding the Downtown Community Safety Partnership to an extent. And, and now True North Real Estate Development, the real estate arm of True North, it's about to spend $650 million buying Portage Place Mall and renovating it. Now, I spoke to Mark Chipman for an hour this week. He said he wouldn't be proceeding with the Portage Place project if he wasn't convinced the city of Winnipeg and the province of Manitoba were finally serious about trying to reduce the number of homeless people in Winnipeg. I sure don't think we'd be exercising the option in June. If I didn't see and feel a real commitment from our public sector partners to once and for all engage the root causes of uh, of the crisis we're in right now. That's a statement. Once and for all, engage is what he said. So, what makes Mark Chipman think that the city and the province are serious about homelessness now? Well, for one thing, Premier Wab Kadu and Mayor Scott Gillingham talk to each other. Their staffs talk to each other. This might sound really basic, but not very long ago, the mayor and premier treated each other like the two Koreas. Anyway, back in the fall, David Thompson was in Winnipeg. He was one of the wealthiest people in Canada and one of the owners of Winnipeg Jets. Mark Chipman said he took David Thompson to see the homeless shelter. He also took him to see the mayor and the premier at City Hall. And after some discussion, Thompson and Chipman decided they want to help create more housing in Winnipeg, specifically transitional housing. And that's housing for people with a history of homelessness or addictions or mental health issues who need help, not just finding a home, but keeping that home. What we lack desperately in the city right now is the ability to transition people out of that type of living arrangement into a more independent uh, circumstance and it just doesn't exist so when people talk about you know uh, about homelessness it, it's a it's a very complex uh, subject that requires a range of of different housing options for people to move through and we're stuck um, so we're stuck with a lack of transitionary housing there are lots that are trying and some that have been successful and but that's where his interest lies uh, is in how do we expand more capacity in that realm. Now, we know about his philanthropy, but how unusual is it to have uh, an NHL owner commit to helping out with a homelessness crisis like this? Well, NHL owners are not renowned for their altruism. You may have seen stories or being paying attention to the markets in, in Edmonton, Calgary, and Ottawa, but Mark Chipman's weathered a lot of criticism for the way he runs the Jets, especially from season ticket holders, too. So, But sports economist Gary Hodgson says no... Uh, Glenn Hawks, excuse me, <laughs> no NHL owner has expressed an interest in community development like Mark Chipman. I think it's ex extremely unusual. I actually spent a bit of time thinking about the other owners and the kind of uh, uh, businesses they have, the kind of engagement. And it's really hard to come up with another example of an owner who's made such a large commitment to not-for-profit investment to kind of building up the civic space. For the most part, owners are very rich people. Um, they're very good at business, they're very good at making money, and they also have often quite large, large commercial investments around the arena, around the team. So Mark is really an exception. Now that's a national perspective. Hodgson lives in Ottawa, but Winnipeggers may not share the same affection, but Portage Place development alone means it's now impossible to separate the idea of downtown development in Winnipeg from, from True North's development in downtown Winnipeg. I put that idea before Mark Chipman. 
some days it's a real daunting um, responsibility. Uh, other days it feels somewhat natural in that it's just what we've been doing, you know, or, we, or trying to do. It, it, uh, I, I don't think we set out to be that or to have that responsibility, but it's, it's, we've kind of fallen in that path. And so, you know, it is what it is. We're, we'll do, do the best we can with, with what we have. Uh, Bartley, thanks for coming in with us today. You're more than welcome, Ernest. That is uh, Bartley Kivas, senior reporter here at CBC Manitoba. And as always, I'd like to remind you, you can find the full story and more details on our website. As uh, Bartley mentioned, he sat down and, and spoke with uh, spoke with Mark Chipman rather for, for an hour. So you can read the full story on our site at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Your neighborhood, your community, your country, your world. Your news. Your news that matters. News that belongs to you. Your world tonight. Every night, seven days a week on CBC Radio 1. On demand on the CBC Listen app and everywhere you get your podcasts. Commotion with Elamine Abdel Mahmoud. It's time to talk about funflation. Crime story. You got one witness who can't be found. This American Life with Ira Glass. There are signs that read, see something, say something. Radio Lab. What is coming up? What is going wrong, actually? The Sunday Magazine with Pia Chattopadhyay. How does the last 24 plus hours complicate or change things? Telling stories. Sunday night on CBC Radio 1 and on the Listen app. Well, on the show after 8 o'clock, we are going to uh, talk about the details of something that's pretty exciting. Marjorie Dalhouse is on mat leave. Now, that's exciting in itself. Congrats, Marge! Such a cute little baby boy. However, that means that Radio Noon is now being hosted for the next year by Janet Stewart. So welcome back to the CBC Radio Airways to Janet Stewart. She uh, hosted Radio Noon, of course, for a period of time as well in, uh, in uh, well, quite a number of years ago now. Uh, also speaking of quite a number of years ago, if you're a longtime CBC Radio listener, you might remember that it used to be a call-in show, a one-hour call-in show called Questionnaire. Well, dust off your phones, everybody, and uh, have your numbers on speed dial because the call-in is making a return with Janet. So we'll tell you about that uh, when Janet joins us after 8 o'clock with some more details that we're going to be able to share today. So that is coming up on the show after 8, uh, in addition to uh, another story as well that I'll mention in a moment. Right now, though, let's go to your CBC News headlines with Heather Wells. Good morning. Well, the city of Winnipeg is looking into the cost of weekly trash cleanups at encampments. According to a new report, there are are some 150 homeless camps spread out across the city right now. Last year, cleanups cost taxpayers nearly $84,000. This report says providing weekly cleanups to all camps would cost around $4 million. A Clear Lake lodging owner says talk of a boating ban has already led some people to cancel their stays. Ashley Smith just opened Turtle Village in Clear Lake Fishing Village last year. She worries for the survival of her business if boats aren't allowed. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 8.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to have a big conversation about that here on the show uh, via Zoom after 8 o'clock. Uh, two guests are going to join us who live and do business around Clear Lake uh, as well. So we're going to hear more about it. Uh, right now in Winnipeg, I can tell you that we are seeing some blue sky, but probably more cloud depending on where you are. The sky condition is... Partly cloudy. Uh, it is 4 degrees in the city of Winnipeg. Our high today is 14. We'll kind of have this mix of sun and cloud for the start of the day and then a 30% chance of showers late this afternoon and early into this evening before it clears out for what looks like it's going to be a very sunny next three days ahead in Winnipeg. The morning commute has been springtime lovely. 788-3093 though if uh, you want to challenge that and you've seen anything on your morning commute that you think other people should know about, please call Dylan on the commuter line. 788-3093. I'm Marcy Marcus. Stay with us. More to come on Information Radio, including World Report. That's up next on CBC.
on Q with Tom Power. This is Jim Rockford. At the tone, leave your name and message. I'll get back to you. Mike Post composed TV themes like The Rockford Files and Law and & Order. He played guitar on I Got You, Babe. He discovered Kenny Rogers, a conversation with one of the most important figures in modern music that you may never have heard of, Mike Post. That's coming up on Q, followed by Commotion with Elamine Abdel Mahmoud on CBC Radio 1, the CBC Listen app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. The CBC News is next. Coming up in half an hour, it's The Current with Matt Galloway. Climate change is altering our oceans, our forests, and our whole world. A group of neurologists now say it may also be changing our brains, our ability to learn, and our mental health. A look at climate and the brain coming up on The Current. This is World Report. Good morning. I'm Marcia Young. Shareholders of Canada's biggest bank are gathering today for their annual general meeting. The Royal Bank of Canada is facing criticism for its support of fossil fuel projects. One report last year named RBC the world's biggest fossil fuel financier. As Thomas Daigle reports, activists are demanding the bank divest. In the heart of Toronto's financial district, dozens marched ahead of the Royal Bank's big meeting. We want their shareholders to know that they need to hold their executives accountable. Crystal Cavalier from the Okanichi Band of the Suponi Nation is fighting a major natural gas pipeline near her South Carolina home, a project financed in part by RBC. We are here to tell them that they didn't get consent from our people. Recently, the bank bowed to pressure and agreed to start disclosing the ratio of money it puts into clean energy projects compared to fossil fuel extraction. But that should only be the start, says Tara Hauska from Kuchiching First Nation. They know they have a serious problem. They know that their shareholders care about this. In a statement to CBC News, the bank says it's working with clients and communities to help transition to a greener economy and intends to triple lending for renewable energy by 2030. Olaf Weber researches the financial industry and sustainable development and says it's not only RBC. Of course, it's a Canadian situation. Canadian banks are relatively high compared to others. Canada has a high ratio of, of fossil fuels. It's a reality that demonstrators say isn't changing fast enough. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's testimony on foreign election meddling suggests he's skeptical about the information he gets from Canada's spy agency. He spoke for about four hours yesterday. Our Janice McGregor was watching it all. She joins me from our parliamentary bureau. Janice, what do we know now? Marcia, notwithstanding how seriously Justin Trudeau says his government takes the threat of foreign interference when it comes to specific examples of election meddling that this inquiry has been probing, the Prime Minister seems to be either unaware or unconvinced. He described being pulled aside in an airport lounge during the 2019 campaign and briefed on what CSIS had shared with Liberal Party officials about their nomination meeting in the Toronto riding of Don Valley North. But Trudeau concluded their concerns weren't corroborated or confirmed. He suggested spy agencies don't understand that to get people out on a Saturday afternoon, sometimes you got to organize buses. In 2021, however, he said he wasn't briefed until after the campaign about potential disinformation in Chinese-language social media that was targeting Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole and several of his candidates. As for the Globe and Mail reporting that a diplomat in Vancouver took credit for having defeated Conservatives and then returned to China, well, he didn't see that as proof either. One can imagine a diplomat in a far-off land, uh, you know, wanting to right back home to say, see, look, look what I did, aren't I good? Bragging is not doing. One thing that we did not hear a lot about was foreign interference from other countries. Beyond China, there's a conspicuous absence of this in yesterday's testimony. And as for what this inquiry has been told about India meddling in several writings in 2021, in his cross-examination, the lawyer representing sick Canadians at this inquiry accused officials of deliberately redacting information about Indian interference and asked if not talking about India's meddling had enabled the Modi government's increasingly aggressive behaviour. Trudeau snapped back. That's certainly a question one needs to ask of the previous Conservative government that was known for its very cosy relationship with the current Indian government. 
we know from other reports to this inquiry, this threat may have actually been assessed after votes were cast. Thank you, Janice. You're welcome. Janice McGregor reporting from Ottawa. Officials in Russia are still working to help the thousands of people displaced by floods. Water levels are rising in the Ural River near the border with Kazakhstan, and the flooding hasn't yet reached its peak. It started after a dam in the region collapsed on Saturday. U.S. President Joe Biden is reassuring Israel amid concerns of a strike from Iran. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and as proxies, is ironclad. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is promising to retaliate against Israel. A bombing in Damascus destroyed Iran's embassy and killed 12 people. There are reports U.S. diplomats are now reaching out to Iran's neighbors. They are asking Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, and Iraq to help ease the tension in that region. A Vietnamese court has sentenced a real estate tycoon to death, Chung Mi Lan was found guilty of illegally controlling the Saigon Joint Stock Commercial Bank for a period of 10 years. She was convicted in a fraud scheme amounting to over $12 billion. Lan used thousands of ghost companies and bribes to government officials to siphon funds. She was arrested in October of 2022 as part of a high-profile anti-corruption campaign. Her case is the largest ever fraud case in Vietnam. There is a glimmer of hope for Julian Assange. The WikiLeaks founder has been behind bars in the UK since 2019. He's been fighting extradition to the United States. He would face multiple charges relating to the 2010 release of classified U.S. military documents. The CBC's Richard Madden is in Washington. And Richard, what is the latest development in the Assange story? Yeah, there is some hope for Assange and his supporters after some surprising comments by President Joe Biden. He was asked about Australia's request for the U.S. to drop the slew of charges against him. Now, you'll recall for over 10 years, U.S. prosecutors have been seeking his extradition to face several espionage charges on U.S. soil for posting troves of secret military documents related to the Iraq war on the site WikiLeaks. Now, Assange's supporters say he's a journalist who exposed the truth and is protected by the First Amendment. But U.S. prosecutors say he endangered lives and exposed classified military secrets. Back in February, the Australian Parliament passed a motion for Assange to be released to his home country of Australia. And that was the question put to President Biden at the White House. Take a listen. Uh, do you have a response to Australia's request that you end Julian Assange's prosecution? We're considering So it's a bit faint, but he said we're considering it. So returning to Australia would give Assange a lifeline because if he returns to the U.S. and is convicted for the several espionage charges, he faces up to 175 years in prison. Assange has been fighting extradition for years. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, he sure has. Ever since he first published those secret military and diplomatic cables supplied by former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning back in 2010 on WikiLeaks, He's been on the run. He was granted political asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London in 2012 until he was basically kicked out five years ago. He's been in a London prison ever since, fighting extradition to the U.S. to face these charges. Now, Australia argues former President Barack Obama commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence before he left office. So Biden, who was Obama's VP, should give Assange the same treatment, they say. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. Canada's health minister is promising hundreds of thousands of seniors will receive dental work in May, and it will be covered by the new Canadian dental care plan. CBC News previously reported many dentists across the country are reluctant to join the new program. Marina von Stackelberg has an update. I'm supposed to have a cleaning, and I keep putting it off because I don't know what's happening. Halifax senior Julie Kelsey should have insurance to pay for that dental work starting next month. But first, she has to find a new dentist. Her current clinic won't accept her claim through the new Canadian dental care plan. It does sound that it's going to be really hard to find someone. The public program will eventually subsidize trips to the dentist for one quarter of Canadians that don't have private health insurance. 1.7 million seniors are the first group to be covered next month. 
But dental associations say many dentists are reluctant to take part because Ottawa requires too much paperwork to process claims. Canada's Health Minister Mark Holland says he's working on that. We set up a task group to really get that administrative burden down as low as it can possibly get. National dental care is a key demand of the NDP, part of a deal keeping the Liberal minority government in power. New Democrat health critic Peter Julian says Ottawa needs to simplify things for oral health care providers. We want to maximize the number of dentists across the country who are part of the plan. The Conservative opposition will not answer questions of where that party stands on the $13 billion program. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. And that is the latest national and international news from World Report. News anytime, cbcnews.ca. I'm Marcia Young. by Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or on YouTube. Well, we are trying to see some uh, sunshine out there this morning. It's cracking through some clouds and uh, today our high is going to be 14. Abby's in to talk though about a few more details. You might have actually seen some rain yesterday in parts of Manitoba. Pretty solid rain, didn't last long, but some of the clouds opened up over Transcona. Well, this uh, half hour on the program, we're going to continue our discussion about Clear Lake. Parks Canada, as you heard yesterday, if you were with us, is considering a ban on boats in Clear Lake this summer to help stop the spread of zebra mussels. Today, we're going to turn our attention to how this could impact the community. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to hear from uh, two business owners up in that part of Manitoba. As well, this half hour, we're going to hear about something brand new. The return of the call-in over part of Radio Noon. So stay tuned. We'll tell you all about it. And we'll tell you what uh, question is going to be on the show today. Uh, So spoiler alert, it has to do with the Winnipeg Jets. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells, who's in with headlines. Good morning. Good morning. And this also has to do with the Winnipeg Jets. The owners of the Jets want to help this city reduce homelessness. True North Executive Chair Mark Chipman says he and co-owner David Thompson are talking about creating housing for people who need transition out of homeless shelters. We'll hear more about that. And the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra warns a plate set sold at its store contains toxic levels of lead. Health Canada has issued a recall order on tranquility and teachings. They are sets from the Canadian Arts Prince Indigenous Collection. The WSO says it will remove the product from its inventory. You can hear more Manitoba News coming up at 8.30. All right. Thanks very much, Heather. You're welcome. Well, this is just for the YouTube folks out there. I'm not sure actually what's going on, but can you see my, I'm like, my whole face is gone all of a sudden. There's this, and I'm enjoying it, but I know that I'm going to have to shut it down because you want to see my face probably on YouTube. But there's this gorgeous stream of sunlight that made its way through the clouds now, and it's just coming through the blinds that are down for our TV shot. And I just can't help basking in it for a second before it gets taken away. Uh, Abby, what's the weather going to be like? Like today um we are seeing that crack through the skies that's what we're seeing sunshine just are filtering in not a bad day in winnipeg i mentioned a mix of sun and clouds and that's what we're getting now it's more of a recipe of cloudy condition and some sunshine coming in and a slight chance of showers today currently winnipeg we are at four degrees as the day progresses the forecast has that mix of sunshine with us all through the day but you'll be seeing the uh, cloudy uh, conditions also mixed with that and then uh, some showers later accompanied by a northwest winds picking up later now despite the uh, rain possibility that we're uh, forecasting for you temperatures will be climbing to a comfortable 14 degrees today the clouds tonight will gradually clear and then leaving us with partly cloudy conditions and if we look ahead to tomorrow it's shaping up to be a delightful day we, we should be expecting plenty of sunshine and clear skies with a temperature in a pleasant 15 degrees so get ready to soak up that vitamin d and uh, you should enjoy the weather if we move across the province brandon is currently at two degrees he's seen a mix of sun and uh, sun and cloud already it's zero in thompson it's minus four in churchill Duffin, Gimli, Steinbeck and Morris all sit in at three degrees and we'll see a mix of sun and cloudy conditions and of course a chance of showers in the afternoon. But across the province, it's a mix of uh, cloudy conditions and some 
Sony breaks cracking here and there. Yep. And uh, we'll be seeing 15s and 16s. All right. So that took me a long time to close that blind. I know. I left because we've had the same. Okay, seriously, we have had the same blind in this studio since I think for 20 years. And you, it's one of those where, do you have one of these at home, listeners, where sometimes you, you pull the cord sideways. It's still a corded it's blind. The, yep. And it won't slide. So you kind of have to go click, click. Click, click like one by one. And I am at so. disadvantage here because the sun is actually glaring into the screens ahead of, in front of me right now. <laughs> so I'm like almost blind. I'll tell you what, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> good so, problem, I'll take it. Sunshine on our faces. All right, let's get into what's happening with the morning commute. Yeah, sunshine's a good problem to have if you're out there being an active commuter, you're waiting for a bus today. Lovely day out there. We haven't actually heard any problems out there on the commute for drivers today. It's been a quiet commuter line, and I think that's fantastic. I think that means this uh, junior Friday early morning commute going smoothly. But of course, still more time on the program. If anything changes for you, you see something getting your way out there on the roads, however you're getting around, let us know. Call 204-788-3093. Well, up first, this half hour, as mentioned, Riding Mountain National Park is, of course, a popular tourist attraction in our province and destination. But the threat of zebra mussels in Clear Lake has some businesses worried. Parks Canada is considering banning all boats from Clear Lake this summer to help prevent the spray spread of invasive, uh, the invasive species, zebra mussels. But some say if the boat ban goes ahead, it really could impact local businesses. Yesterday on the show, we were joined by Scott Higgins. He's a senior research scientist at the International Institute for sustainable development. First, here's what he had to say. These species can spread incredibly quickly, and so it's really important to try to contain them. And, you you know, now that there's this new tool that is potentially uh, available now to to treat uh, and and eradicate zebra mussels from lakes, you know, I really encourage... Uh, the province and the, and, the, and the federal government to to really make that attempt and to limit the spread until they until they make that attempt. Now he's talking about the new tool uh, being potash. It's a chemical that you put in the water. But uh, Premier Wab Canoe has already weighed in on this idea of uh, a potential uh, boat ban, saying that he really doesn't want to see it come to that. So today we thought we would look at uh, how people in the area are feeling about what is uh, potentially going to happen with the lake. Via Zoom, Ashley Smith joins us. She runs Turtle Village and the Indigenous Ice Fishing Village in Wasagamine. Good morning to you. Good morning. And Carly McRae is with us as well via Zoom. She owns three businesses in Wasagaming, the Lake House, Arrowhead Family Resort, and Dance Land, which is an event center. She's also the overall chair of the Clear Lake uh, Country Enrichment Organization. Good morning to you. Morning. Thanks for having me. So uh, how concerned are you to start with, uh, Ashley, first to you about uh, what's being talked about in your area and a potential change to uh, boating being allowed on Clear Lake? Well, uh, that's why I'm here today. I'm very, very concerned with what's happening. Um, you know, this this decision here that, you know, the potential zebra mussel infestation that we might potentially have they have not found anything to date so we're still doing testings we're still in that phase but you know it's already affecting businesses i'm a first year indigenous tourism operator this has never happened here in riding mountain before you know so this impact i can't even gauge exactly how bad it's going to be but it's not it's not a matter of if but when this will going to impact us and so um, you know, our business that we do is all about sustainable, all about um, environmentally friendly tourism, teaching people how to travel and enjoy the vi- and, and also um, take care of the environment at the same time. There's new ways to do things. And so we're on the forefront of bringing that kind of tourism and sustainability to the area. We live that every day. I, you know, I moved here my entire family three years ago. It's been a long process to get into the park, very long, difficult process. Um, most people would break and we wouldn't be here. It's a miracle that I'm here. And I say that like people need to hear that it, it's not by chance. It took a lot of time, effort, gathering people, building relationships. And also if if this can't succeed, how long will it be till another business rises up? We've planted seeds to allow 
and and show people that this is possible. So to shut down the lake or restrict access to um, the area is detrimental generationally. Um, Carly, how would a, a potential boat ban affect your uh, various businesses in the area? Uh, look, we are we're already feeling the impacts uh, because of this uncertainty. Parks Canada uh, has not engaged in public consultation on this issue, as Premier Canoe and the provincial government have already pointed out. Entrepreneurs in our area, like Ashley and myself, have worked incredibly hard over the last ten years to transform Clear Lake into the key drive to tourism destination in Manitoba. We have a brand new gorgeous Nordic spa development, thousands of acres of incredible wilderness, wildlife viewing opportunities. And now we have this incredible history to tell um, with Ashley being the first indigenous entrepreneur in the area. We are uh, really, really hopeful that Parks Canada will work with us to find a long-term a uh, healthy solution to this issue um, that looks at the long-term management uh, of the lake um, and ensures uh, its health and the health of the community for future generations. Because this is already being talked about, as you said, and Carly, you, you uh, alluded to the fact that there has been lack of communication with Parks Canada, yet people are already talking about it. Have you already been experiencing the impact of that? Like, what are people in the area saying? Have you had cancellations? I don't know if Carly or Ashley, I'm not sure who wants to respond. Maybe both of you. Uh, Ashley? Yeah, so, yeah, sure. Um, when we first were notified by uh, Parks Canada of the three options, I immediately seen um, tangible impact of, of cancellations. People worried what's going to happen. You know, when, when people are not informed, they fear the worst. And so that's exactly what's been happening here. Um, We've also, you know, there, there's so much more than just the businesses that are going to be impacted. It's detrimental to us. And if we don't have economy, we don't have anything. And so we're just raising up and we've started a woman's group, first of its kind here, the Seven Nation Equay, and we're bringing back um, Indigenous days. That hasn't happened here. We want to utilize the water. We want to have canoes. We want to do our traditional things. And that is going to be cut off. And it's never happened in history. So it's detrimental. We started our first um, Indigenous career fairs. This has never happened. We had busloads of kids come out and meet the local businesses and local local um, stakeholders. And, and we're trying to create jobs. We're trying to build relationships. And it just feels like... You know, we get a step forward and we're being teared down and put back. Can, they need to hear this because can, it's generational. Can you elaborate on the three options Parks Canada uh, put forward in front of you? Um, uh, Carly, are, can, can you answer that question or should I stay with Ashley? Can you answer that, Carly? Uh, sure. Um, Parks Canada, back in January, presented to verbally uh, to a very small group of folks, three different options for uh, lake access for the summer season uh, 2024. And as we understand it, a uh, decision is imminent um, on one of those options, uh, likely the most stringent option. So we're here today and-, so and banning, the banning boats, just to be clear here for the listeners, banning boats was one of the options. Yes, banning boats in a certain regard was a part of all three options. The most stringent option would be banning all watercraft, including personal watercraft, floaties, beach toys, everything. Okay. Uh, and so, so the provincial government has all obviously realized that uh, this will have huge and far-reaching impacts on not just our local economy, but on the tourism economy in the province of Manitoba. It's also, uh, I, I feel, an extremely dangerous precedent to set uh, as far as um, decision wide, wide sweeping decision making of this type uh, without proper public consultation, without consultation with the various levels of government without consultation with our indigenous rights holders in the area. Um, 
And so that's what we're asking for. And we've been asking for since January when we were um, initially presented with these options. Do you have a sense, Carly, of how much revenue businesses could potentially lose if, uh, if, uh, if a ban is enforced this summer? Uh, one of the things that we have been requesting from Parks Canada, uh, along with our, our partners in the area and, and various levels of government, is a, a proper economic impact assessment to gauge that impact so that uh, we can all uh, understand what this will mean for our community. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Riding Mountain National Park knows that the community of Onil and the outlying communities all depend on tourism, whether you own a construction business, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an electrician, uh, whether you own a restaurant or a hotel in the area, all of those things tie back to tourism. Uh, and without it, uh, the community, the face of the community will change forever. Um, just as a last question here, I have a minute left uh, and, and we will talk again about this as this is ongoing. And obviously uh, you have deep concerns about lack of communication, about the options on the table uh, and obviously the future of your businesses and, and uh, generationally, as you mentioned, Ashley, uh, being a first Indigenous business uh, in that area in this way. Um, but I do need to ask, I mean, if people, you know, we, we have talked to scientists that have serious concerns about the lake. We've all seen what's been happening with zebra mussels, how quickly this can escalate. And, and overall, that will ultimately impact Clear Lake and, and the area anyway, as well, if it gets too far. So what other options might you be open to looking at if a boat ban, in your estimation, is too far, too fast, not the right thing to do, Ashley? Yeah, so, you know, my first question is, where do the zebra mussels come from? And why aren't we getting to the root of the cause and how they got here? We're the ones that are having to deal with something that we didn't bring here. So um, putting a substance is into the lake isn't something we want to do. We want to enhance the efforts. We, we don't even have a management plan. We haven't seen anything um, that we want to we want to structure jobs. We want to engage the, the community and the businesses and the First Nations to all get on board and people are aware of it right now. So this is a perfect opportunity to gather the community. And we all want to save the lake because, you know, in efforts to eradicate potential zebra mussels, they're going to eradicate the economy and any potential seeds that have been planted for future generations at so this point. More research, more discussion, more moving forward too fast, too quick. Carly, last quick word to you about where we might go from here, given that this is a real threat to the water. Yeah, again, we're asking, as, as Ashley has mentioned, we're asking for a long-term solution, a long-term management plan. I understand that um, there are folks in the scientific community who are weighing in, and that's so important to understand their perspectives. Um, the thing that we're hearing um, from experts on potash is that it is a, a short-term solution. Uh, the question that we're asking with potash treatment and with banning boats is what happens next year? What happens in five years? Um, as we've seen in Lake Winnipeg uh, and other lakes across North America, um, we need a long-term solution. So we're encouraging Parks Canada, the province and the federal government to look at solutions to protecting the downstream waterways. There's only one small creek that leaves Clear Lake. Um, so something that we've suggested is looking at ways to protect the outflow from Clear Lake. So, um, you, have, and so you have questions about all the options, whether it's boat ban or potash and all of it. More questions and answers. Absolutely. absolutely. What, we want to come up with a solution we, uh, that ensures the health of the community and the province and, and the watershed long term. We'll have to leave our discussion there for this morning, but I appreciate both of you. Ashley Smith, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you, Carly. Thank you, Carly McRae. Uh, both of them joining us via Zoom from the Clear Lake area. Ashley is an Indigenous business owner. She runs Turtle Village, an ice fishing village in Wasagaming. Carly McRae owns three businesses in that area in Wasagaming, the Lake House Arrowhead Family Resort and Dance Lamb, which is an event center. She's also the chair of the Clear Lake Country Enrichment Organization. Check it online for ongoing coverage. Ever hear a really good radio show and fall in love right away? Fall in love at first listen with the CBC Listen app. Find CBC radio shows like As It Happens and Now or Never and stream them anytime, anywhere for free. Download CBC Listen today. 
It is 8.28 a.m. and I've been teasing you all morning because there's a big change coming to Radio Noon. And that change starts with the fact that Marjorie Dalhouse is on that leave and for the next year... This lovely woman's going to be filling in hosting Janet Stewart. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning, Marcy. Welcome back to the airwaves. I'm loving it. You did a stint on Radio Noon, I know, for a while. So this is like a return. Uh, Really, really exciting. It is fun, and we're trying something uh, kind of wacky today. We're hoping this will become a more regular thing on Radio Noon, but let's try it once and see first. So today we're having a call-in right after the 1230 newscast. We want people to call and just tell us about their feelings about Winnipeg whiteouts. You know, these big parties that were announced, the details yesterday by True North Sports and Entertainment. How do you feel about that? Do you love these parties? Do you live in the area and you wish they'd go away? Is it a fantastic showcase for our city or is it a huge waste of tax dollars? We want to hear from you. And if you've got any ideas on how True North might change things up a bit, the man who needs to hear those ideas, Kevin Donnelly, is going to be our guest today. He's the vice president of venues and entertainment with True North, so he's the guy. And we'll be talking with him today from from 1230 on. You know who I'd love to hear from, Marcy? Who's that? Besides everybody. Um, the, you know the entourage that always goes escorting the queen? Her, yeah, remember in the old Jets Arena, they had this big portrait of the Queen, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's a team of people who always go to these white par- whiteout parties. One of them is dressed as Her Majesty. Well, oh. I'm wondering if this year... <laughs> They'll probably call in. Well, I hope so, because, you know, what's going to happen this year? Are they going to keep up the homage to the person who inspired that giant mm. painting at the old arena? <laughs> or is King Charles going to show up? Is Camilla going to be there? You never He's, know. I, you never know. Hopefully we'll find out today. <laughs> I'm going to throw out the question the phone numbers because we're tight on time, Janet, and thank you. Thank you, Marcy. So, Radio Noon, uh, Janet Stewart hosting, and the call-in makes a return. 12.30 to 1 o'clock on Radio Noon today. And the question today is about the Winnipeg Jet Whiteout parties. So how do you feel about them, as Janet said? Do you think they're good for the city? Are they worth the tax dollars? Yes or no? 1-800-268-5483. That's the out-of-town line. So keep that on hand if you want to call in later. And also uh, in town, 204-780-0893. Get those numbers on hand as the call-in makes its return to Radio Noon. Right now, your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 831, it is partly cloudy, 5 degrees right now. We do once again have a chance of showers today, a high of 14 with a mix of sun and clouds. The owners of the Winnipeg Jets want to help the city reduce homelessness. David Thompson and Mark Chipman are talking about providing transitional housing. CBC's Bartley Kivis reports. For that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Applause for Mark Chipman following a speech last week at Winnipeg's Portage Place. Chipman's True North Real Estate Development wants to redevelop the mall. The project includes a residential tower. Chipman says he wants to do even more. He says he and Jets co-owner David Thompson, one of the wealthiest people in Canada, want to help create housing for people living in shelters. What we lack desperately in the city right now is the ability to transition people out of that type of living arrangement into a more independent Uh, circumstance and it just doesn't exist. Ottawa-based sports economist Glenn Hodgson says few NHL owners are this community-minded. It's really hard to come up with another example of an owner who's made such a large commitment to not-for-profit investment. Chipman and Thompson met with Winnipeg's mayor and premier about housing in December. Premier Wab Canoe says their real estate and business acumen can complement the work of governments and non-profit organizations. Bart Lakivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. The city of Winnipeg is looking into the cost of weekly trash cleanups at homeless encampments. According to a new report, there are currently 150 homeless camps spread out across Winnipeg. Last year, cleanups cost taxpayers nearly $84,000. The report says providing weekly cleanups to all camps would cost around $4 million. Mayor Scott Gillingham says the Executive Policy Committee is going to discuss this next week. Cabinets can be dangerous. They can be, frankly, unsightly. Uh, and, and for people that live in proximity to an encampment, there are concerns. Gillingham says while camps need to be cleaned up, more work needs to be done to house people with wraparound supports. A Brandon woman says she's lost faith in the banking system after someone cleaned out her bank account using a fraudulent e-transfer. Nicole Roy says she lost $3,000 from her accounts at a Bank of Montreal branch last fall. 
right away, the teller said that there's no way that this could have happened without me giving out my card and my PIN number to someone. So right from the very beginning, I really felt like, oh no, you know, like I got the indication that this was not going to go my way. Roy says she has never given anyone her PIN or BMO bank card. She says the bank gave her $500 as a goodwill gesture, but she's still trying to recover the rest of her money. She has filed a complaint with the National Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investments, but Royal isn't optimistic that's going to help. That's because only about one quarter of banking complaints filed last year resulted in monetary compensation for the complainant. A Clear Lake lodging owner says talk of a boating ban has already led some people to cancel their stays. Ashley Smith opened Turtle Village in Clear Lake Fishing Village last year. She worries about how she's going to be able to sustain her fledgling business if the federal government bans watercraft over fears of invasive zebra mussels. Smith was happy to hear Manitoba's Premier, Wav Canoe, call on Ottawa to avoid banning boats. We as people have to be a solution. And it's not keeping people away. That's not the solution. We all have the right to use the land and the water freely here in Canada. Parks Canada says banning watercraft is one of the options it's considering after live zebra mussels were found in Clear Lake late last year. The Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is asking people to destroy a collectible set sold at their music stand because it has toxic levels of lead. Health Canada has issued a recall order on Tranquility and Teachings sets from the Canadian Art Prince Indigenous Collection. The plates feature artwork by painter William Montague. The WSO says it is accepting recalls on all of the plate sets out of an abundance of caution. It's going to remove the product from its inventory and it will post recall notices at upcoming concerts. The WSO is asking anyone who bought those plates to immediately stop using them. Health Canada says as of late last month, almost 1,500 plates had been sold in Canada. You can find more news updated throughout the day at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, I just want to get a listener line on here because someone has called to weigh in on biking. Uh, Earlier this morning, we were hearing people say, you know, sharing the road, but yes, we're a car city. Uh, We got this call. Hi, my name is Lena. My opinion on the matter is we need a city that works for everyone. And my experience in Winnipeg is that it's very car centric and it's very difficult to get around as a pedestrian or as a cyclist in Winnipeg in comparison to some other cities in Canada, and I think Winnipeg needs to improve on that front. Um, And I personally very much appreciate the the bike infrastructure. If you want to weigh in on that, uh, tis the season. 788-3205. Now, I want to give you a different listener line. If you want to call in to the Alive portion of our Radio Noon for call in, they're asking about whiteouts. If you have a question for Kevin Donnelly and you won't be able to uh, take part live, you can leave it on the Radio Noon listener line, 788-3797. And it's going to be uh, mostly, uh, well, cloudy, although this morning the sun is winning, so we'll see what develops. Chance of showers this afternoon in Winnipeg. Take care, everyone.